Hi, I'm Candace. And I'm Ripley. And I'm John. And this is Com Explaining. The show where we had to call out the Super Mario Brothers to come unclog in a fucking toilet. <laughs> Hey, what's the matter with you? What's the matter with you? What's the matter with both of you? What's the matter with me is my head hurts. <laughs> what's the matter with the toilet is... Well, it, nothing slow. at the moment, but ominous. It's a slow toilet. It takes forever to f- be able to flush it's against. Jaws, it's the Jaws music of the shark on the horizon. Probably because it is just as ancient as everything else in this apartment. Mm. Like... You can tell none of the appliances have ever been updated. That's impressive. Well, the fridge has been giving us trouble lately. Yeah. It just, like, makes noises sometimes, and then it stopped working the other day, but then... Yeah, that's the weirdest thing with an old fridge. That it might (laughs) seem to stop working, and it'll start working again. Well, the problem with that is it was off for long enough that... Things started defrosting, Ooh. and the inside, the temperature inside the freezer was like 60 degrees. Ooh! So, that's yeah. not normal. Yeah, that's not as bad as my fridge and its uh, occasional intermittent weirdness. And it really is occasional and intermittent. Good but, for you. But that's enough talking about appliances like a bunch of grandmas. <laughs> <laughs> like people who have to deal with appliances. You know, like adults do. Ripley has received a new friend today. I did receive a new friend. So what no one can see here and what will probably get me shamed now that we mention it is that we've got a whole bookshelf. We've actually got more than one bookshelf, but the other one's not down here. We got a bookshelf full of Funko Pops, Marvel Funko Pops. It's not just Funko Pops. Mm-hmm. They're like there in addition to the other stuff. It would be funny if it right. was just Funko Pops. No, it's Funko Pops and books and CDs and, and DVDs and Blu-rays and games. And, and I do feel like I should clarify, it's not just like the random fucking I have to get every single one Mm. completionist Funko Pop collection. It's like specific ones. Right. We particularly like the ones that are comic booky. Like I picked up a comic book Star Lord that I really love. Mm. You say we as if any of those are mine. (laughs) No, but I did get some I did not know that. I did get some because you liked them. Like the Thor and Loki. I actually did um order my very first Funko Pop <gasps> recently. It's on the way. And What's I, your first Funko Pop? Uh, well, as you know, it was <laughs> uh, Loki from Agent of Asgard because Ooh. Marvel doesn't make anything Agent of Asgard ever, so... <laughs> so it's basically the first time Agent of Asgard has ever... <sighs> Not the first time, but it's just... One it's, of... It's extremely rare that you find anything for Agent of Asgard, and it's eternally baffling to me. So yes, I found out actually on Twitter that apparently they have put out a new line of Funko Pops of X-Men for the upcoming new cartoon. Hmm. The new old um, revival cartoon. Yes, yes. Um, The one we can't watch. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> the mm. one we're not allowed to watch. Which yes. means we definitely can't watch the new part of it. No. Yeah. Yeah, and the line is all pretty good, honestly. They all look pretty good. There's, like, uh, Gambit and Bishop, which are, you know, not ones that you see very much. <laughs> um, I've had a couple Gambits, but I can't recall having seen Bishop. There's also uh, Magneto, of course. And there's a Cyclops that's really cool. I think they did a really good job on, like, his hair. And he has a little, like, spark on his visor. Mm -hmm. It's very cute. He looks pretty neat from the picture I saw. But the most exciting one, the one that I saw, (laughs) that I knew that Ripley had to have, is the Goblin Queen. (laughs) Yep. Anybody who's been here for a very long time might recall the one time I made a weird character summary of the Goblin Queen. Yeah. Oh, God. And, um, yeah, because I know they love the Goblin Queen, and I also am aware that, like, she doesn't get a lot of merch attention, and and that is apparently the first time that there's ever been, like, a Funko Pop of her at all. She she very specifically has baby Nate, too. (laughs) And, and, like, I went and looked at it, and it was already low stock. (laughs) Oh! Um, but apparently it was on sale at GameStop, so... We went and picked it up, and it was like ten bucks. So 
We have her now. <laughs> yep, she's up there, up on the top shelf. Oh. In her special place. Yep. I've also got a collection of first appearance de- X-Men just missing the beast. Oof. You'll get them eventually. I know I will. It's No, that's my, like, series of gifts that I know <laughs> I can get for them. <laughs> And I appreciate them very much. I even put your X-Men sign you got me right mm-hmm. next to them. Aww. Yep. It's now its own little display on the bookshelf. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that's talking about Funko Pops after talking about <laughs> appliances. That doesn't make us seem any older. It's fine. All right, you guys want to tell me what happened last time on X-Men? Okay, so. You got this. <laughs> uh, yes, so I've actually, I've been thinking about this. Uh, quite heavily, even more than I've been thinking about um, my own segment of the podcast. (laughs) So, last episode, we read um, (laughs) what I am going to call one of the worst um, pieces of fiction ever to be created. Right, right. I tried to wipe that from my brain. Thank you for reminding me. Oh, um, I achieved. I achieved something. We don't need to go into, like, the details and exactly why it was bad. It We did read Avengers 200, and, like, if you know, you know, right? <laughs> um, yeah, but that did uh, lead into... An Avengers annual? Yeah. Um, that was the introduction of Rogue, so we had to read it. <laughs> Did we have to? No. Did it help explain why? We would have been confused if we hadn't read That's Avengers 200. That's very true. And I also do think that, despite the fact that it is that <sighs> genre of bad, or even... For that reason, we should talk about it, right? Because, like, it's good to be able to shine a light on that stuff and be like, this sucks, and these are the reasons it sucks, and especially because, you know, we are very, like, vocally lefty, feminist, (laughs) queer-led podcast, so we... I don't think it was a bad thing that we covered it, but I also don't really want to get into it. Um, because of while the reasons of it's bad. While we're doing the recap right now. Because, <laughs> we can explain why. Because the things that we had to cover, namely sexual assault and incest, we don't need to get any further into it than that. But they're so damn heavy. Yeah. That we don't really want to just woo on through here. Because that was so nasty it really truly earned the content warning it's recapping it (laughs) Mm -hmm. yeah we don't we don't want to re oh content warning for the recap exactly um so yeah uh we got the first appearance of rogue she was like working with um mystique to break the rest of the brotherhood out of uh rikers island and she had slicked back hair. She looked terrible. <laughs> yes. Um, and she was just like, I don't know, draining all the Avengers to get their powers. Except um, for Wonder Man. For except for Wonder Man. Unspecified reasons. Um, and Vision. And Vision. Well, but for obvious reasons. Right. <laughs> um, she also had apparently attacked and drained Miss Marvel off screen. Did that ever, like, explicitly happen anywhere, or was it always just... It was off-screen, I believe. Okay. Entirely, because this is her first appearance. Right, okay. So, yeah, so that happened, and I guess because she, like, held on to the powers for so long, now she has them forever. Yep. Yeah. Um. And then what happened after she did that? Uh... After they tried to break out the Brotherhood, and it didn't go very well. Um, I mean, used they used Tony Stark as a bomb. They did. Um, more of a mortar, but yeah. <laughs> true, true. I, although, I, I, he felt more like an unguided 
bombed in a mortar. He wasn't <laughs> launched, he was dropped. I don't know, I mean, he didn't really explode, he just See, kind in of... The, in the episode, I called him a human torpedo. Yeah. I mean, either way, he was dropped, and that's... that's... So, yeah, they immobilized his suit, basically, and then just dropped him through the prison <laughs> to destroy the generators. <laughs> it would have been really funny if he just went clunk yeah. and uh, didn't go anywhere. Yeah, that would have been pretty funny, but that's not what happened. Um, so that, you know, all the cells opened and, and the Brotherhood were able to, like, get out and try to meet up with Mystique. But the problem is that the Avengers and the X-Men and Spider-Woman... <laughs> um, not quite. What? The Avengers, yes. The X-Men weren't there. The X-Men were not there. Okay. <laughs> I believe you. I'm just... All right. Right, 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 right. Okay, so the X-Men were involved because Spider-Woman saved uh, a woman who turned out to be Miss Marvel. Yep. And they needed Professor X to, because, like, her brain had been scrambled, basically. Yep. And they needed Professor X to, like, fix her memories. You know, doing the opposite of what he usually does. Yeah. (laughs) So that's how the X-Men were involved. They were involved with the whole... Spider Carol Woman, situation. Carol situation, um, yeah, and then the Avengers went to Rikers Island to stop the Brotherhood, and uh, they did that <laughs> through some they, shenanigans. They did do that. Wonder Man got punched through a, through a building, and then was like, "Yeah, whatever," <laughs> as he, he does. Off. Yeah, as he tends to do. Um, helps when you actually just energy and you don't have any injuries to walk off. Yeah. So, um, I mean, there was more to it. It was very, you know, involved and messy, but like, we don't need to go into every single It was a fight scene. It was a fight scene. It It was mostly a fight scene. It happened. And then the Avengers eventually were able to defeat the Brotherhood. And Mystique and Rogue escaped while uh, the others, I guess, went back into jail. <laughs> yep. The jail that was pretty wrecked from the way I remember it. Yeah. yeah, the jail was kind of messed up. There was a down at least one guard tower. Right. <laughs> um, and the generators were destroyed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they sure were. Uh so yeah, they stopped the Brotherhood. That was great. Um, and then they went to um, X Mansion, and they reunited with Carol, and she yelled at them for uh, valid reasons. For very valid reasons. <laughs> and uh, it's hard. It's again hard to get into that without yeah, yeah we, getting we're... into the issue at hand. But it was very very. Cathartic. Cathartic. That's the perfect word. That's the word I was looking for. It was not just, like, not just cathartic in the fiction. It was also cathartic, like... About the other issue. About the people who wrote the other issue. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yep, you got it about as well as I think we're going to be able to get it. (laughs) Yes. Without needing a content warning. Yep. First up for us is X-Men 149 from June of 1981, written by Chris Claremont, penciled by Dave Cockrum, inked by Joe Rubenstein, colored by Don Warfield and Glynis Ween, and lettered by Janice Chang. No new names for us, and so on with the show. As the X-Men continue their work putting the Danger Room back together... God, they've been doing this for like three years. (laughs) (laughs) Charles Xavier can't join them. Instead, he sits in the control room doing a little bit of work. In the face of the increased psychic static limiting his range again, he slowly come to the conclusion that this is the work of Magneto. And so he pours over his files. He then thinks over the past battles with the Master of Magnetism, perhaps hoping to find some chink in the armor. Suddenly, the screens on his computers all fuzz out as Kitty Pride comes bounding through the wall, Wearing an Ooh. outfit. That's a lot. They let her dress herself. I I have seen pictures of this outfit. 
They didn't actually let her dress herself. Charles yells at her about it because you're not supposed to get your individual costume until you've earned it. Kitty can't just wear different clothes. What kind of private school does she think this is? Wait, wait. (laughs) This is something someone picked out for her? No. No, this is something she picked out for herself, which is absolutely unacceptable. A teenage girl would not pick this out for herself. (laughs) For those of you listening, I encourage you to look. But if that doesn't pique your interest, I'm going to summarize what this as. What if Elvis was a superhero, but for his day job, he was a colorblind roller skating teacher? (laughs) And I think that'll sum it up quite nicely. Yeah. But Charles snaps at the youngster. Everything he was working on, gone, thanks to Kit Kat's tendency to fizzle out electronics she glides through. I don't know how to tell you to save your work, old man. Mm -hmm. (laughs) When you don't, you're not in a place to bitch about it. It's your own damn fault. You say this from recent personal experience. I say this from recent personal experience, (laughs) yes. I like how Kitty is wearing, like, thigh-high socks over a Lycra bodysuit. (laughs) They're not gonna stay up. No. No, no, no. Hell no. (laughs) Unless they're like Velcro. So maybe there's tape involved? Could be. Fashion tape doesn't stick well to synthetics. Right. I, I never said fashion. Down in the danger room, a dejected kitty air walks down towards the ground, mind still dwelling on her telling off. The rest of the X-Men are hard at work on the machinery of the danger room, though Logan proposes that they not even bother and everyone can just go play hunt your friends in the woods like he and Kurt. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, Logan... Someone's gonna get killed doing that. That doesn't work for Aurora. Anyways, a man can only drink so much beer. How many cases does he really need? (laughs) Apparently he's already got 29 IOUs. God. When Aurora spots the gloomy teenager caught up in her thoughts, she comes up with an idea to liven things up around here, hitting the girl with a blast of air hard enough to send her tumbling through the air. (laughs) Spotting the fun to be had, Kurt springs from the wall, catching pride in his arms before tossing her back towards the wall once more. No worries about hitting, though. Logan's there to catch her. He teases her a bit about Piotr getting jealous before dropping Kitty down into Petey Boy's arms. The group aren't blind. They see how bad her outfit is, but under threat of zap by storm, they all manage to keep their (laughs) comments to themselves. Under threat? Uh, she actually zapped Kurt there. Good. The moment of calm doesn't last for long, though, as Charles gives the mental call for his X-Men. By the end of the night, the team is bound for the South Pole, off to check on the professor's hunch. And or fixation. Mm-hmm. Right. You, you know how it is. While Storm's thoughts dwell on Angel's departure, Piotr and Logan play a hand of cards. Petey Boy is rightly trouncing Logan, mm-hmm. and he heads off to drink away the pain and loss of this hand of Gene Rumry by pounding down some brewskis. Maybe he's an anxious flyer. Um, Logan's facial hair has never been good, but I feel like it's been especially bad lately. It's, he's going through changes. He's got some pretty intense sideburns at this point in time, nearing on mutton chops. That, those are not. They're they're not (laughs) mutton chops, they're something else. Those are not mutton chops, those have a fucking mind of their own. (laughs) Those things are ridiculous. We'll call, I'm going to call them mutton chops. Okay. (laughs) I don't have a better word for that. Bad. Bad. But when Logan opens the door to the storage locker, he's shocked by what he sees inside. It's a sleeping kitty pride. He gives her the wedgie of all time, Mm -hmm. hauling the kid up by the britches. And Storm is not pleased to see the girl here. Sure, it's just a scouting mission, but should they actually run into Magneto, it could quickly turn dangerous. We know Magneto has no compunctions about fighting children. Right. (laughs) He'll hit a child, he doesn't care. She's not going to turn this plane around, because this could be time critical, but she is not happy. Ooh, you disappointed Storm. Ouch. Oh, no. That's even worse, right? Mm-hmm. I'm not angry, I'm just disappointed. (laughs) It would be pretty annoying to have to turn back now, because even as Storm chews out the girl, they've arrived. Kitty's shocked to learn that the base is actually underneath the volcano, but they're not taking that way in this time. 
Instead, instead, the X-Men land the Blackbird and bundle up in some parkas, searching for Phoenix and Beast's escape tunnel. The X-Men then begin their descent into the bowels of the Earth. After a long trip into the guts of the volcano, the X-Men finally reach the hard rock shell left behind from the lava's onslaught. They tag Piotr in to punch a hole, reasoning <laughs> that in his metal form he might survive whatever lava exists on the other side. With a hell of a punch, Pete opens up a hole, revealing the surprisingly undamaged interior of Magneto's base. Not remotely melted, really. Yeah. Yeah, it shows remarkably little sign of the lava that had filled it last the X-Men saw the place, so it seems someone has been in here, clearing away the wreckage. The floor is even cleared off enough that Kitty has no problem skating on it. It's the others that have a problem with her doing that, mm. warning her about making so much noise. I'm surprised they didn't just make her stay behind in the jet. <laughs> well, what if something happened? She'd be all alone. And remember last time what happened when you left Kitty in the jet. Ah, trip. so what we don't do is leave her alone, because especially not near the jet, because... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, all right, fair. <laughs> Suddenly, Kurt cries out. When the others turn to respond, they find Kurt holding the decapitated remains of Nanny, aping Hamlet with her head. Mm -mm. Alas, poor Nanny. I knew her Horatio. A robot of infinite jest. Logan prefers Macbeth, so he further slashes Nanny's head to ribbons. <laughs> Good. Aurora really must feel like she's dealing with a bunch of children today, as she tells Logan off for his dramatics. Apart from Kitty, they all went through it. He isn't special. <laughs> But now that that's settled, they've all got a lot of facility to search, so it's time. Let's split up, gang. Rip. Y you never want to do that. Come on. Oh my god. Piotr and Kitty head off together, and Storm heads off on her own. It's only once she's alone that Aurora hears someone calling her name. She whirls to the shadows as the voice questions if she forgot who she murdered. But Aurora remembers only too well her failure to save Garak and she immediately flashes back to the moment. It's enough to leave the woman drenched in a sweat. Once it passes, though, there's nothing to see. No Garak, nothing but a shadow. She calls to check in on the others, but no one has seen anything. Off on their own, Kitty and Piotr walk through the cleared-out hallways of Magneto's hideout, on the lookout for anything unusual. Though the scope of the facility is fantastic, the two youngest X-Men have only found a wall. On the other side is the gooey center of the volcano, so it's at least a mildly interesting wall. But the rest of the X-Men aren't exactly in dire need of that report. They're ready to call back when all of a sudden Colossus is, is cold-cocked by a hulking figure even larger than he. All alone now, Kitty screams. Standing nearly twice her height is Garak, now uh. horribly disfigured from his fall in the Savage Land. Oh boy. He's here as Magneto's appointed keeper, and now that he's found trespassers, he's going to have to murder them all. Ooh, I, okay, this is kind of grisly, but I like how his arm and leg are melted together. <laughs> right? That's very cool. It's a nice detail. Yeah. He's also like half crystal. Mm-hmm. That's the half that's not melted together. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I assume that's supposed to be like the heat or pressure of the volcano? Assumedly. Wasn't okay. he a meat man before? Well, he got turned into a rock man. Yeah, he was a meat man who got turned into a rock man by having oil di oil dripped mm. on his titties. Yeah. And then he fell in a hole. <laughs> and Aurora was like, I killed him. And it's like, no, that's not what happened. But, you know. Killing him and failing to save him are two distinctly different things, son. You did also, not throw him down the hole. Also, he was like a tyrant who did try to kill you, so <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, you know, she's got her morals or whatever, so. Well, Garak is here as Magneto's appointed keeper. Now he's found trespassers, he's going to have to murder them all. That the trespassers are these particular trespassers is just the cherry on top. Offering only a quick death, he lurches towards the child, now stuck forever in a hunch, his arm and leg melted together on one side. But Kitty phases straight through the villain, strangely enough seeming to cause him pain. 
But the girl doesn't flee. She just scurries to Piotr's side, trying to wake Colossus to no avail. That's when a vengeful Garak smashes open the wall, separating them from the lava flow, intending to kill hopefully both X-Men, but particularly young Sprite. Yet again, Kitty has no options, and she screams. Screams with such intensity that even with the vastness of the facility, Aurora hears her. Between that and the sensation of rising heat, she knows what has happened. Immediately, she fashions up an immense wave of cold and wind, hoping to stop the lava before it encroaches on them any further. Elsewhere in the tunnels, Kurt and Logan are left hanging on for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> they understand what happened, but that doesn't make it any easier to resist the onslaught. And then finally, the growing heat is dead and the wind blast ends. Aurora is first on scene, everything now coated in a thick layer of ice. At first, she sees no sign of either of the kids. She hears it before she sees him. The sound of Colossus sliding across the floor towards her. <laughs> frozen God. solid. The Colossus sickle. Uh, rip. The Russian collides with the leader of the X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's understating it a bit, but... Uh, not... Okay. Clarify. Not by choice. He is frozen. He is frozen. <laughs> he is frozen solid. He's been, he's frozen and has been yoked. He's been he's being used for um curling. <laughs> uh, so how much bludgeoning damage do you think he does? Youch, a lot. Once Kurt and Logan catch up with her, Storm lays unconscious on the ground next to the still frozen Colossus. Good thing he doesn't have to breathe in his metal form, huh? <laughs> <laughs> it sure is. Yeah, he's fine. Taking stock of the situation, Wolverine advises Nightcrawler to find cover, suspecting an attack. That or Aurora just tripped and knocked herself the fuck out. Mm -mm. With the area seemingly cleared out, Garak peers onward, blaming Storm for Kitty's death as well. That was definitely her fault. There was nothing you could have done about <laughs> that. Don't beat yourself up about it, Garak. Garak also expected attack, though, and he begins to shine the crystalline half of his body radiating out in a blindingly brilliant light, reflecting off of all the ice piled up around them. Woof. And that's not the end of their problems. With all the illumination, Garak can now see Nightcrawler and takes, aims with his, takes aim with his disintegrator eye beams. He comes close, but doesn't quite hit home, allowing Wagner to port away and onto his back. Good luck disintegrating him there, champ! <laughs> He gets a few shots in, but eventually Garak manages to get his mitts on him. He throws Kurt off his back, though while he's distracted, Logan is suddenly there at Rocky's back. He gouges in deep with his claws, only for the crystal to heal over before his unbelieving eyes. A short ways away, Kitty Pride emerges from one of the walls, having faced through the lava, because apparently she can do that. I was kind of wondering if she could. Well, she can. that answers that. Mm-hmm. She takes a few moments to stress cry, overwhelmed by the pressure she'd just been under, before she finally gets ungracefully to her feet. The sounds of fighting have completely come to an end. Kitty's all alone again. With the fight now over, Garak has decided to dig a hole with his eye beams to see how Aurora likes it. <laughs> As the monstrous keeper lifts Aurora high overhead, Kitty shows up on the scene. The other X-Men are beginning to come too, but are still all out of it. They've only got seconds to act, though. Luckily, Logan doesn't ask questions when he's first awakened, so when Kitty says, Toss me, mm -hmm. he does. At the same time, Kurt bamfs onto Garak's head, attempting to wrest Storm free of his grasp, but it's to no effect. So set on vengeance is he that he throws Kurt aside and leaps into the pit, Aurora still in hand. The X-Men clamber to the edge of the pit, peering down into its inky depths, but even with a flashlight, they can't spot Storm. Mm. Still, Wolby thinks he hears something inside the pit. Oh boy. The rest of them aren't so sure about that, but Logan is absolutely confident. And so after a moment's discussion, Kitty is the one to head down, her ridiculous gold bodysuit glittering back the light of her flashlight all the way. After descending away, she comes upon Storm's battered body on a ledge on the side of the hole. She's not dead, but she's not in great shape, and so she calls up for Kurt's help. That's when Garak lunges out of the darkness to try for a second time to kill the girl. Oh, boy. For a second time, he fails, falling right through her to his demise. Hopefully. 
Kurt arrives in a poof of brimstone, and the two have to figure out how best to get Aurora to safety, finally settling on sending Aurora up with Kurt. Unfortunately, this means this is going to hurt for one of them. When Kurt reappears, it, it is with a pained cry. Still, it gets the job done, and Colossus tosses both X-Men safely back on level ground. On the trip home, as they eat, the X-Men have many more questions, but at least one answer. Charles was right. Magneto is definitely up to something. Suspicious. Meanwhile, up in the Bermuda Triangle, Scott uh, Summers is dressed like heck? a fish prostitute. Um, <laughs> this is a lot. Apparently, Magneto really committed to the aesthetic of this place, because both Scott and Lee Forrester are now garbed up in sea-themed garments. Apparently, so far so good... Lee ran with Scott's fake name, even though I'm not one even 100% sure Magneto knows Scott's real name. <laughs> that would actually be... <laughs> like, why would he know that? Yeah. You have a secret identity, and he doesn't give a flying fuck about your human name. Anyway, if I'm forgetting some reason that Magneto would even know Scott's name, let us know in the, down below in the comments. But, like, whether or not Magneto ever bought that story remains unclear, because Lee calls him Scott right in front of Magneto. Oh my god. It doesn't matter, though, because he's already got him pegged as Cyclops anyway, so he might as well take the blindfold off, because his optic blast won't work here anyway. Hmm. Really? Unlike earlier when they worked just fine, but yeah. now he turned on his machine that just says, Fuck you, Scott Summers. <laughs> he had a Fuck you, Scott Summers machine. Well, you know, when... When you have been known to fight Scott Summers, sometimes you have to... Build a fuck you Scott Summers machine. Exactly. That's um, fair. I desperately want to know what is going on with this fucking, like, Atlantis <laughs> Ancient Ones thing, uh, city from the bottom of the ocean shit, and I'm assuming it's going to be explained at some point, but what the fuck? <laughs> This he is, really committed to the bit, right? It's mm -hmm. just so did, random. Did did he just read H.P. Lovecraft? Is that it? Is did this it, just the aesthetic he's going for now, or is like did the, was the city already there and he just like developed it for his own purposes? Or I don't know. Consider he's a dramatic bitch, so if he's going to have a sea themed base. <laughs> We have Commit. <laughs> and I have to have sea themed costumes ready for any guests. Of course. And not just sea themed costumes, because that could be like a fucking wetsuit or a That's bikini true. or something. <laughs> These are like over the top fucking high fantasy sci fi looking bullshit outfits, okay? I always call this Scott's fish prostitute look. <laughs> I mean. I don't know how better to explain it than that. It, he's yeah, wearing it, his his um shirt <laughs> <laughs> has an octopus on it. It's that like appears a, to be um made of metal. It's like a huge sculpted golden octopus gently cradling cradling his pecs. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> With a deep V. And, like, pointless tacits for some reason. <laughs> extremely, extremely skin-tight <laughs> pants. And, like, those pirate boots that fold down over the top, which actually means that they're, like, thigh highs and he just has folded them. <laughs> Although they might have been designed to fold. Could be. People rarely commit to the actual thigh-high boots anymore. It's quite the look. It's it's a lot. That's not even getting into what the fuck Lee is wearing. Which is no. actually simpler. <laughs> it's... I disagree. It's... <laughs> it's a lot. Where would you rate this This versus the Eric the Red costume on the, sl on the slutiness scale? Oh, Eric the Red is definitely slutty. Yeah. Like, he even went so far as to add booty shorts to that one. Mm. <laughs> like, come on. Fair enough. Now, how would you rate that? This comic, um, it was fine, I guess. Like, I didn't hate it, but it definitely, I don't know, it didn't, like. It, it feels like it's uh, trying to just keep us 
interested, and it, but not go anywhere. It's holding place while this is happening. Yeah. Which is kind of a problem, actually. The, the interesting story is happening in the B story, and the B story is tiny. There were interesting elements. I like that they came back to Magneto's old lair that they were in before. Um, that callback was cool. Never and introduce a lair that you're not prepared to return to. And, um... I mean, like, the volcano base, if anything, I double back on my point about if you're going to have a sea-themed base. <laughs> like, he has a volcano base, he has a space base. Why not an undersea-themed base? <laughs> True. Fair enough. I liked elements, but the whole thing didn't super work for me, so I'm gonna say, like, 3.5. Sure. It was above average, but not as good as I tend to expect. I'm at like a four. I liked all the pieces pretty well. Mm -hmm. I don't know that they entirely came together, so I can't rate it higher than that, but right. it wasn't bad. What do you think CMRO thought? Three. Yeah. Not too far off. They were pretty close to you guys, though. 3.44. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So next up, we have the much-talked-up X-Men 150. Written by Chris Claremont, penciled by Dave Cockrum, inked by Joe Rubenstein and Bob Wysek, colored by Glynis Ween, lettered by Tom Orzachowski and Gene Izzo. X-Men versus Magneto. Nuff said. Enter the drama queen. <laughs> Turn up the stage lights, for he has demands to make to all the leaders of the world. He has a pelvis this time, but it needs to be a little higher up. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Give him total political control within a week or he fucks all their shit up. Of the world? Yes. Yeah, of everything. Specifically, he demands that the killing of mutants stops now. And he's demanding it of Ronald Reagan, specifically. <laughs> yeah. Someone very likely to respond. <laughs> we know that about Ronald Reagan when, Reagan when there are his people in need... Ronald Reagan is always there to help. <laughs> Reagan. <laughs> Fucking Reagan. Piece of shit. Oh. Is that supposed to be Thatcher? Don't get started on your... I was so your, close. Your, I was so, so close. close. I to almost losing popped. It. I almost popped. I almost said that I'm glad he's dead and I'm glad he died of something as horrible as dementia and that I only hope that it was more, I only could wish that it was more publicly known at the time because it would have oh made him even more embarrassed. I was so close to saying that. Yes. It's, right, it's really good that you stopped yourself. We're so glad you were able to resist. <laughs> Anyway, he also demands nuclear disarmament, which is something that I'm sure Ronald Reagan... <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, Ronald Reagan's handlers will not allow that. <laughs> but not because he gives a good goddamn if humanity destroys itself, but because mutant kind live peppered throughout them. Anything <laughs> so widespread as nuclear destruction would devastate his people, and anybody who decides to, decides to fight him on it is not going to live to regret it. Okay, I'm starting to... So, uh, DC makes sense. Mm -hmm. uh, London makes sense if you think they had any power at that point. They didn't have that much power at that point. But Moscow is obvious. Mm -hmm. But China's actually pretty reasonable. Saudi Arabia? Kenya? Kenya's the one I don't get. Yeah. I mean, maybe I'm missing some kind of important historical context there, but I'm not sure why we're in Kenya. Uh, but is he is he making this one speech to everyone at once? I, I believe so. so. Yeah. Okay, um, because at demanding the Saudis denuclearize their military is a very odd. I, <laughs> so I demand Kenya denuclearize now. I appreciate the coloring on um, the Chinese men here. I appreciate the coloring on the Kenyan man. Oh, uh, no, I that's do not Saudi. appreciate the coloring on the Saudis. And I don't understand how they <sighs> managed to nail it on the black man, but for some reason, the Saudis, they just couldn't pull it out. Just couldn't fit, couldn't figure it out. So, so, we're, what we're, so Marvel has been saying for between Thor and uh, X-Men in a, over the course of a decade that people of Middle Eastern descent are just gray. Yeah, they're gray. Yes. Dim the lights. 
And now he awaits applause from his onlooking audience. But he'll get none of it out of Scott Summers. <laughs> As Magneto pours himself a glass of champagne for his glorious victory, Scott's just rolling his eyes, snarking about how the world leaders will just call him on his bluff. And I mean, hey, he gets to roll his eyes and gets to have <laughs> be seen rolling his eyes. I was just thinking it must be so nice for him to experience colors again. Right? <laughs> and hey, he can also be snarky visually with his right. eyes, and it will be recognized. I mean, we can't prove that he hasn't just been rolling his eyes behind his glasses and we never saw it. But, I mean, assumedly he has been. Yeah. But nobody knows exactly. until now. Magneto, well, what a privilege you are to get to see Scott Summers roll your, his <laughs> eyes at you. That was a privilege Magneto engineered, but hey. Yeah. But Magneto never bluffs, baby. Lee is all of a sudden enjoying Magneto's hospitali hospitality a little bit less. <laughs> but Scott knows exactly why he's doing this. To make a safe world for mutant kind. And on top of that, without all the money spent on weapons, finally the world can build a utopia. Is that so bad? And that, you know what happens then? When we get rid of all the weapons, then in the 30th century, we get Zarko the Tomorrow Man who wants to enslave the world with a cobalt bomb. Oh my bomb. god, he did it. In one <laughs> universe, this works. And the we mad get, lad did it. We get that we, we get that weaponless land and it ends in ruled by a tyrant. Scott and Lee have some issues with mags being at the top of the pecking order of this utopia, though. Mags is just sick of the world being how it is. Air quotes freedom while many starve, living eternally under the threat of the mushroom cloud. I mean, mood. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're still there, my guy. We're on the same page, bro. <laughs> he has the power to make these things a reality, so that's what he's going to do. He then reads the room and determines that now would be a great time to ask where Jean Grey is anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Rather than this chick. So Scott tells him exactly what happened to Jean. Oh, boy. Probably a case of don't ask questions you don't want the answer to. Because now Mag's heart is heavy. But Scott isn't willing to hear any of it, swatting him off as he expresses his condolences. Hey, that's more human than Magneto has ever acted before. <laughs> and this causes the villain to blow up at him. Just gonna read this because it's a pretty raw line. I grieve for her. I know something of grief. Search throughout my homeland, you'll find none who bear my name. Mine was a large family, and it was slaughtered, without mercy, without remorse, so speak not to me of grief, boy. You know not the meaning of the word. Woof. Oof. The argument between the men is cut short when Maggie's computer begins screaming out in warning. Shockingly, the nations of the world weren't just going to merrily <laughs> concede and throw out all their fun new toys. Yeah. Well, they are going to throw them. <laughs> they, they did throw them. Yeah, a distant submarine does deign to dole out a few for Mags and Co., and they're fast inbound. No worries. With a wave of its hand, the missiles fall harmlessly into the sea. Um, how harmless? Because they're, they're <laughs> nuclear weapons. They, um, can still... Well, maybe he disarmed them by doing that. That would be a very neat trick. Well... He can do shit like that. I have no doubts that he could do that, honestly. That just leaves the matter of payback. And Scott starts, after Scott starts getting feisty about it, Magneto bubbles him up in a spear of magnetism and gets to work. Oh, yeah, that's a thing he can do. <laughs> oh, just turn the torpedoes around. <laughs> you know? The Soviet submarine Leningrad prowls the North Atlantic. Given they just fired off the missiles that could have ended the world, the men are anxious. <clears throat> it's about to get worse. On the bridge, the captain tersely awaits further orders from Moscow. What he receives instead is a nasty gram from Magneto, <laughs> appearing on the bridge via hologram, explaining that all their base are belong to him. <laughs> as someone set them up the bomb, their shit is then <laughs> fucked up. As without emotion, Magneto manipulates the electromagnetic currents around the controls to lock the ballast tanks open, and the Leningrad begins to uncontrollably sink, Woof. descending rapidly towards crush depth. That's a fucking nightmare right there, dude. Yeah. Oh, God. That is cruel. And this one is like a proper submarine. It's not being controlled by like a Logitech controller. <laughs> <laughs> That's Me rough. 
Meanwhile, back in the Kremlin, officials panic at the loss of communications with the submarine. They don't remain alone. Mags isn't done, and so he appears, as before, by hologram, instructing them to behold his power. The city of Varakino is under attack! Oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> One moment, a young town going about a peaceful day. The next, a volcano erupts from, erupts from the massive spiderweb of cracks across the city square. It begins to look like a scene from a Roland Emmerich movie mm. as her new skyscrapers begin to tumble into the fiery wreckage below. But Mags isn't totally merciless. I don't know if he decided there might be a mutant or two living in Varakino, <laughs> or that thousands of innocent Russian citizens didn't deserve to die for the mistakes of the Kremlin. I'm right? going with the, the possible mutant theory <laughs> yeah. and not um, thousands of innocent uh, Russians don't deserve to die. And so this has been a very slowly unfolding disaster, allowing time for the populace to evacuate the city. Lee Forrester is really not enjoying her time now, mm -hmm. clinging to Scott as she buries her face in her hands. Desperately, she, avoids t she tries to avoid the scenes of destruction playing out on screen, as Mags continues to threaten the Soviet brass, dropping Moscow as a potential next target. Come sunset, Lee is alone, sitting on a ledge overlooking the sea, ruminating on Magneto's hatred for humanity and taking it kind of personally. Mm -hmm. When Scott comes to check on her, Lee is back on her feet, wrapping her arms around her new employee friend. <laughs> <laughs> They're not really sure what to do about this, though Summers knows he has to do something, because this won't end well. Even if he gets his way, this won't end well. It's already not going well. Mm -hmm. They then fuck again as high in the sky something is blasted out, of the blasted out of the sky in a flash of magnetism. But the lovebirds don't even pay it any mind. <sighs> wow. Guys, you ever been so busy uh, <laughs> in flagrante that uh, you don't notice a plane getting shot out of the sky during... Who's paying attention to that shit? <laughs> well, not them. What kind of boring ass sex are you having if you're paying attention to shit going on in the sky around you? Anyway. I st I'm sorry. I just... Scott and Lee, I still can't. It's bad. It's really bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's really bad. Look, look. It's the rebound. This is just him on the rebound. No, 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 no. Lee is the problem here. Lee is the problem here. It is, really? Look, imagine if Do this... Do you not was, remember? If this was any other... Say we swap the genders here. We flip things around. I have a cis... Scott is instead a cis woman and Lee is a cis man. And then... And then <laughs> the captain... Then her boss comes fucking hitting on her all the time. Sexually harassing her on the job. Right, at work, in front of the other employees. And then... And then, like, gets pissed off because you won't sleep with them. After pressuring a couple times, making advances. If this were the other way around, this would be considered completely unacceptable, and for good reason. Yeah, 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 point made. Point no, made. Lee is being absolutely, completely uncool. Anyway, they have no idea that it's actually the Blackbird, now flying uh. towards the sea in a steep dive. Oh boy. But prior to that, the bird was doing all kinds of loop-de-loops, sending her passengers flying all about the cabin. Wolverine collides hard with Storm, knocking the leader of the X-Men unconscious. And no shit. <laughs> That's, I hope so, considering the bones. And that means bad news for the X-Men. Without her mastery over the weather, there's little hope in getting the jet back under control. I'm sorry, why would... Never mind, I was about to ask why he wasn't wearing a seat belt, but he's Logan, so... <laughs> That's actually... I don't need an answer. That is the answer. Exactly. He's like, I don't need that shit. And then as soon as... No, they, everyone else needs that shit as because soon as of the... you. Yes, you are a fucking... Project object. Yes. They still try their best. As the Blackbird continues its fall, Piotr struggles against the controls, but he gets the metal of the control yoke to give before the plane does. Yeah, that, that tracks. At her shoulder, Kitty does her best to try and rouse Storm from unconsciousness. She manages it just before they would have hit, and Storm does manage to level them out some. 
Even flying level, there's just not enough lift to get them back up into the air, and so the blackbird splashes down, quickly slipping beneath the waves. I mean, you know, a gentle, like, belly down landing on the surface of the water is not as bad as... It is incredibly difficult to make a water landing. Yeah. Mm. The fact that they did it is astonishing. The whole thing where everybody was excited about Captain Sully was because... He, it, Everybody lived out of a water landing, and that shit doesn't happen. Yeah, you planes it, tend to kind of make a blast radius. <laughs> <laughs> there have been better times. Ta- there have been other times. Water landings can be better than ground, ground landings, <laughs> but it's very rare that everybody makes it out alive, even out of yeah. a water landing. As the X-Men go down, Charles Xavier rides around in Peter Corbeau's boat. <laughs> this again. Along with Moira McTaggart and Carol Danvers. Oh, hi, Carol. She's still here. Yep, she's part of the she's part of the uh, supporting cast for now. Okay. Keep her safe. You know what? <laughs> no one else can hurt you, Carol. I mean, I be, love that for her. T- to be fair, uh, these guys didn't... Uh... <laughs> yeah. Well, I think, honestly, like... You know, the way we talk about how, like, the X-Men are family, the Avengers are co-workers. This is probably a better place for her. <laughs> uh, I mean, she was betrayed by her co-workers, and uh, Chuck did help. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't help them betray her. He helped her. No, he, he helped her. <laughs> he helped her get better. <laughs> She's safer here. They will take care of her. Anyway, Corbor's pretty trusting of the professor, given what happened last time they went <laughs> right? out on his boat. Well, well, you know, this time the world might end, so... Unlike a good many unfortunate vessels that went down that night, eventually, after the storm, the the Arcadia did manage to limp back to port after Alita, Forrester, and Scott were washed overboard. And so, Corbeau and Co. at least have a good idea where to start looking. The night of the storm was a night of massive seismic activity that wreaked havoc in the area around the Bermuda Triangle. Gee, I wonder how that happened. (laughs) Mm. Between that and the storm, the Coast Guard has been rather busy. The Bermuda Coast Guard, or are there other rules at play out here in international waters? Are we in international waters? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. Unless they aren't. But then the situation gets worse. Charles suddenly loses contact with the X-Men at the same time they drop off of Corbeau's radar. As Charles continues searching for his X-Men, Corbeau and the others rush over to a map. They went down around Julianne K, which is at least in the area Lee and Scott could have been washed to. So Corbeau revs up the engines and the boat rears up on its hydrofoil headed for Julianne K. Oh right, it can do that. I mean, I would honestly just accept that it was like a special sci-fi rich person boat. I mean, that's an actual thing that fancy boats can do. Hydrofoiling is expensive, but fast. The Blackbird finally comes to a gentle rest atop a coral reef. Her occupants are intact enough to strap on rebreathers and kick calmly away from the sunken plane. Headed for an island, Logan spotted as they crashed. But they only have enough rebreathers for four of the X-Men. Luckily for them, Colossus doesn't have to breathe in his meta- <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> Suddenly, he transforms from the mighty Colossus to Piotr Rasputin, farm boy. And oh. Piotr Rasputin, farm boy, needs to breathe. And he instantly panics and inhales a bunch of air and starts to drown. <laughs> water, you mean, am I friend? A bunch of water, yes. Mm-hmm. All the way underwater, he can't break the surface in time, and far, beyond the, and far behind the others, he can't catch their attention either. Eventually, his air supply runs out, and Piotr begins to black out. Well, it was a good run, but... He was a fun it. character. That's it for him. As the moon begins to rise, Scott Summers is assu- still assumedly in post-coital sleep. <laughs> God. But Lee is reawakened and didn't get, apparently didn't get the stress dicked out of her. It's nice that Magneto provided her with, like, sexy pajamas. I mean, it's good. It's how, <laughs> how would you be a good host if you right. didn't provide sexy pajamas? And a clamshell bed. <laughs> so, uh, so is this And the... a balcony where you can look at the moonlight. The digs are a lot. It's yeah, a lot. Yeah, yeah. 
he really planned out a lot for his guests. He didn't even know he was going to have guests. Somehow he, he did this for no reason. He just is really passionate I think about he, like interior design and I fashion. I think he expected to have guests. At some point. I guess he knew that X-Men would show up eventually. Maybe he figured this would be his sea palace from which he rules the world. <laughs> Maybe. And a, what, what's a sea palace? Uh, sea beds. Amenities. <laughs> Apparently Scott told Lee all about the X-Men and everything else, and all of a sudden a lot about him just snapped into place. But it doesn't make her any more at ease about this Magneto situation. Well, yeah, uh, he's probably going to kill her at some point. And so she walks out onto the balcony, where suddenly she spots something down near the water. Despite her fear, Lee gets some bravery behind her and descends the stairs to get a closer look at the situation. She's just about to head back when a familiar hand reaches out of the water and pulls her down into it. As Forrester sla- as Captain Forrester splashes around, Wolverine creeps up onto the pier, getting a closer look around. Wolverine, rude! I don't think that was necessary, Logan. <laughs> Surrounding her in the water are the rest of the X-Men, looking half-drowned, and Piotr looking considerably more so. <laughs> They talk among themselves freely, mostly ignoring Lee, (laughs) and she begins to recognize some familiar names from Scott's stories about his past. She calls out, explaining who she is, much to the relief of the X-Men, so they have actually found the pair of them. But they're not going to be relieved until they can tend to Pete. They don't understand what happened to him, but he's not breathing. So Kitty gets to work, gets hard to work with her American Red Cross CPR certification <laughs> while Logan manages chest compressions. After a while of this, Piotr comes too, spitting up a mouthful of water. It's only after they've got him safe and sound in the land of the living that Wolverine catches a scent. Hey, that's actually really good form um, for CPR on Wolverine's part. Uh, he's doing a great job. So they, they do take into account that he's breaking bones, right? Because that breaks that t- breaks ribs. Uh, it's supposed- yeah, but it's better to have a few chest compressions. Chest compressions. It's better to break a few ribs no, than to fucking die. I know, but I'm just curious. Uh, since they're doing it right, are they actually taking into account that they're also breaking Piotr's ribs? I'm sure they are. I you don't think just it matters. Turn into a little metal guy. Yeah, and have broken metal ribs. <laughs> I think he'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, I suspect that he'll be perfectly fine. There's someone nearby, but he can't find him, and in fact runs right by him, leaving him scared shitless when the man taps him on the shoulder. He whirls on him, drawing his claws on his attacker, but it's only Scott in his new clothes. Mm. First, he teases Logan for missing him, but then as the others ask what happened to his eyes, he explains about Magneto's machines. Clearly, they're affecting them as well. Preventing, preventing them from being able to access their mutations. Uh, so, how do those claws work? Well, I mean, they're still a part of him. Yeah. Yeah. I think things that are innately a part of you, but, mm-hmm. like, if there's something that needs a little something extra, mm. that's not going to work. Right. It would have been a little funny if uh, Colossus was stuck as metal, but no, him drowning is more interesting. Well, if he was stuck as metal, then he would just be fine. Yeah, that's the thing. (laughs) That that wouldn't introduce any conflict whatsoever. He then catches the X-Men up to speed on what's been going on with Magneto. First, everybody hugs him because they're all so happy. They're very happy to have found him alive. You're right. (laughs) (laughs) But he then catches them up to speed on what's been going on with Magneto, quickly rallying his old team into a new plan to stop Magneto from taking over the world. So powers or not, it's up to the X-Men. Well, they still have Wolverine's knives. They do. And, and that's those are very his... effective against a man who has magnetism <laughs> as a weapon. Yeah. Maybe, maybe he just wasn't worried about a metal. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Come to think he, of didn't, it. he didn't make a plan for Wolverine because he doesn't have to. Yeah, yeah. Scott splits the team by gender for some fucking reason. What the hell, Scott? Weird. That's taking the guys with him into the facility. That's so weird, Scott. Why? Why? Magneto created a device. It makes a certain degree of sense, but I still think it's unnecessary. 
Uh, Magneto created a device to raise his island base from the bottom of the ocean by messing with Earth's tect Earth's tectonics. Okay, why did he build it on the bottom of the ocean to begin with? Did he build it or did he find it? Unclear. Okay. He's going to use it to hold the world hostage. Mm -hmm. They don't need to fight Mags, they just need to fuck up his machine. And even without his mutant powers, Wolverine still has his claws. This means they can get at the device without going through the heavily alarmed doors. By cutting through the wall, of course. Of course. <laughs> of course. And he... <laughs> he, he cuts flips through, them all off. <laughs> and he puts a big old hole in a concrete looking wall. Yep. Adamantium beats concrete, baby. Concrete, baby. <laughs> concrete. Finally, they emerge onto a set of catwalks suspended over a massive pit over top the device. This is needlessly dramatic, but I don't know why I'm, I'm not commenting on it, honestly. I'm shocked, considering... Meanwhile, the girls are huddled around a different set of doors, with Aurora hard at work with her lockpicks. Finally, the tumblers click into place, and the women step into Magneto's computer room. Plan one was to have Kitty shut down the machine by reprogramming the computer, but she's not familiar with the language, and or it's encrypted. Either way, that's not going to work. So it's time to improvise. Storm continues to ascend the temple and, and stumbles onto Magneto's bedroom. Even the intrusion of light from the hallway doesn't wake the man, and Storm questions for a moment if it wouldn't be better to just kill the man now, as Ooh. he sleeps. Woof. Meanwhile, down below, the boys have realized they can't turn the machine off, so now again we're at plan two. Wreck the machine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It hangs suspended in a giant shaft, so the plan is to sever its connections to the walls to make it fall. Psych volunteers Wolvie and Nightcrawler to crawl over there and cut the connectors, and away they go, flirting all the way. What? Um, that, I mean, that's a thing. <laughs> Logan and Nightcrawler are like, hey, if, if I fall, the first thing I'm going to do is grab your tail. Promises, promises. Oh, God. Oh, God. <laughs> oh, God. They successfully cross the beam over to the machine, where once they stand on it, Wolverine begins the work of weakening the support beams. They don't want them to break while they're still over here, especially with Kurt's powers blocked like this. Without full support, though, the machine begins to vibrate intensely, and it's enough to snap one of the damaged support beams, throwing Logan backwards and off the machine. It's like that one episode of Avatar The Last Airbender, mm -hmm. where they just mostly cut the support beams. Mm. <laughs> exactly like that. Kurt doesn't think twice. He dives off the side, grabbing his friend out of the air, and then he then snags another support beam with his tail, and with a mighty heft, he tosses Logan to Piotr. Though that leaves him to make his trip to safety with a bit less panache, climbing back up after a miscalculated jump. You know, I mean, all things considered, they were the the right well, ones for the job. No, no, we should send Piotr and Scott to do yeah. the uh, high wire act here. The meathead. <laughs> Blast through this very carefully, Scott. Y you know, with your eyes that don't work. <laughs> right. True. Fuck. <laughs> Look, we have a guy with knives and a guy with uh, high, high balance experience. They're the ones. They're the obvious choice. <laughs> oh, yeah. Otherwise, just Scott shoot it at range if it, his powers are working. Yeah, that's not. true. So that's not an option. <laughs> yeah. I completely just... <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Aurora still stands in Magneto's chambers, staring at the man as he sleeps. She has sworn never to take a life, but wouldn't leaving him alive just leave him free to do exactly as he planned? At Maggie's bedside sits a plate with the remnants of his dinner, a sharp knife perched atop it. It would be easy, and Magneto wouldn't hesitate to kill them. Knowing what's at stake, Aurora moves over towards the knife, grabbing it with one hand, but she just can't bring herself to do it. It's at this moment, of course, that Magneto awakens. Spotting the threat, he flings Aurora backwards out the window, but he knows it won't be just her. She wouldn't have come alone. Oh my god, that thing he did with his clothes. It's time to suit up, so he pulls the metal in his costume over onto his body. That's dope. And Yeah, isn't it sweet? And his helmet onto his head. 
There's still one X-Man who has the power to resist, though. Far outside the range of Maggie's machines sits Charles Xavier, having found his students at last. He musters all of his mind power into entering the astral plane to battle Magneto. Uses all his power to do that and none of his power on not being naked. Mm. That would be diverting power from the important things. Dick out, baby! Yep. Also, like, I know we've already gone past it, but I don't really think that Magneto would kill them (laughs) without at least, you know, thinking about it. (laughs) If anything, I think he'd try to convert them. Yeah. That's probably why he made a palace. I mean, consider that even last time when he was pissed off about having been made a baby, he just strapped them into their yeah. eternal baby chair. <laughs> exactly. I like, I think... He doesn't want to kill other mutants. I'm not going to say that he would never kill them, but I think that he would definitely have to think real hard about it. <laughs> Though he might kill Charles. Mm. He might try to kill Charles. Or do something that looks like it could kill Charles? His, his rival husband? I don't think so. <laughs> well, you have to do, do something deadly to keep they're him in, interested. They're in, like, hate love. Yes, and that sometimes <laughs> involves... He might, like, pretend to try to kill Charles. Yeah. But... Okay, Close I don't enough. think he'd go through with it. Head to head, Charles has plenty of power, but Magneto is putting up a fight. So caught up in his battle is he that he doesn't notice how the bolts holding his chair to the deck loosen. Mm -hmm. Not Um, until it's too late. He's also not noticing that Carol has lost all of her internal organs. The art in this issue has been pretty good, but whoa. Not the best moment. No. I feel like there was, like, an issue there between the inking and the penciling, maybe. Suddenly, the safety harness on the chair fastens itself around Chuck, which is good because he's been for a wild ride now. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. His chair soaring up into the air and towards the island temple. Unless his friends get it in (laughs) his head to try and rescue him, he short-circuits the electricity in the boat, knocking all three unconscious. I like how Carol is just watching this happen. Girl, you can fly. Can she? Can she? Can Can she? she? I thought she could. Well, I know she could before. But didn't... Rogue absorb all her powers and memories? I didn't know that's how that worked. She doesn't get to have her powers, only Rogue does? So so this is a helpless Carol? But she gets her powers back later. I know. Well, so it would appear? I'm gonna fucking... No, I know she gets her powers back. I'm gonna smash you over the head with fucking baseball bat. (laughs) You don't have a baseball bat, you fool. I'll go get one. I have one at home. Your fucking shit-eating grin, like, I don't know what's going to happen, guys. And it, it's an unbreakable baseball bat, so, uh... I don't want to spoil anything! Okay, anyway. <laughs> going on. Well, going on, I had to find where I was. I know. All right. Meanwhile, down below, the boys are being boys, continuing their work breaking Magneto's seismic generator. With many shenanigans. <laughs> yep. With a few more slashes into the last support beam, the machine finally starts to collapse down into the pit. But the boys have no time to celebrate. Magneto's already there, and he's got Lee, Kitty, and Xavier hostage. Of course. Wow. Scott challenges that at least they defeated him right before Magneto uses his powers to put the thing right back where it was good as new. (laughs) No shit. (laughs) What the heck? He then uses the walls to imprison the lot of them where they'll be unable to get into any more trouble. Okay. Kitty is horrified when he explains why Aurora isn't here to join them. But little does Magneto know, Aurora survived her fall, managing to snag one of the decorations on the ornate temple with her cape. It knocked her unconscious, but at least she survived. And now that she's back among the living, she slowly, painstakingly climbs her way back up into the window. Hey. For the first time ever, we found a use for a cape. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Also, this is what happens when you go completely insane decorating your fucking castle. <laughs> don't put spikes all over the place. Well, Some, what about the aesthetic? Cape. Well, don't put spikes all over the place if you're planning on throwing anyone out the window. Okay, fair. That's where you have, like, a trapdoor leading to a uh, furnace. Yeah. Mm-hmm. 
Despite her wrench back, Aurora crawls her way over to the computer console and gets to her feet, hefting a chair overhead before bringing it crashing down on the computer. The thing dramatically explodes as Storm scurries away. But down below, Scott feels the pressure behind his eyes beginning to surge. It's the punch dimension. Knock, knock. It's the punch dimension (laughs) calling. Reflexively, he squeezes his eyes shut, knowing what's coming. Mm -hmm. He challenges Magneto's willingness to kill anyone who stands against him. But Magneto won't stand for anyone to get in his way. Of course, that draws him right into Scott's trap. Right in position to blast him back into that fucking hole. Holy shit. (laughs) Get blasted, idiot. After freeing himself and his friends from their bonds, Scott gets a new visor out from the emergency pack, and they <laughs> charge forward, ready to strike before Max can get his bearings again. That's a good thing to keep in your, like... <laughs> He's just had that the yeah. whole time, huh? No, he hasn't. It was in the X-Men's emergency kit. Oh. Yep. The X-Men had it. They just had it the whole time. Yeah. It's too late for that, though. And they charge forward, ready to strike, before Max can get his bearings again. It's too late for that, though. Mags is back and has a shower of shrapnel for the X-Men. <laughs> Oof. With their abilities back, though, they're able to protect themselves a bit more easily than before, including Kurt, who bamps away to grab a pipe and rings Magneto's bell. <laughs> <laughs> Piotr smashes the wall to bring the roof down on Maggie, but that's not enough to stop him. Protected behind a magnetic shield, Magneto's still going. So Scott's plan is, and I quote, Then we'll keep throwing things at him until something finally does. (laughs) Hit him, that is. Great plan. Mags is still playing defense when Storm arrives, blasting him with lightning bolts. But even that isn't enough to stop him as he absorbs the energy of the lightning bolts Mm. to become more powerful? I mean, electricity does charge... Magnets, doesn't it? Fair enough, I guess. Electromagnetism? He probably shouldn't bragged about how that's what he was doing, though, because Aurora just switches to tornadoes instead. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, he has absorbed this motherfucker. And that's actually doing it. Well, he can anchor himself in place just fine. The tornado is stealing the very air from his lungs. Ooh. Oof. He's got one shot at this. He reaches out with his powers and snares Colossus, Uh slamming him into Aurora. A convenient projectile. Colossus, you have to stop being a blunt object used against Aurora. It's all he's got, dude. (laughs) But he doesn't stop there. He turns Piotr on the rest of his friends as well, swooping (laughs) next at Cyclops. Xavier won't allow this to continue, and so with all of his strength, he side blasts Magneto. At the very least, it throws him so off balance that Wolverine is able to slash the helmet from his head. He blasts everyone back away from him, but the rest of the X-Men keep fighting. Except for Kitty and Cyclops, who kneel off to the side. Psych has a plan. While the rest of them are fighting, Kitty goes over to Magneto's computers and takes them out. Without them, his machine's useless. So that's plan three. Okay. Wow, we're on uh, plan C. And it wasn't even um, in the the plan book. Slowly, Magneto is beginning to realize that he can't breathe again. Storm has been manipulating the air pressures in the room, creating a vacuum of sorts. Already it's a struggle for him to stay on his feet. He's got one shot. He manipulates the electromagnetic fields in the outside air, managing to coax a lightning bolt down from the sky, which hits Aurora. Mm. It then continues into Magneto, recharging him again. Uh Uh Uh-huh. This is my problem with the recharging thing. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think... I'm I'm not... I think Aurora should not be affected by lightning. (laughs) I agree. Up in the control room, Kitty marvels at the wreckage that Aurora left the place (laughs) in. But if that didn't get the job done, what will? After a moment of thought, she decides to target the computer's memory banks, phasing into them to erase the data contained within. Hopefully Magneto never learned his lesson about keeping backups. (laughs) Back down in the fight, things aren't going so hot. Magneto has lightning bolts now for some fucking reason. Jesus. He's got unlimited power. (laughs) Unlimited! And um, the coloring on Aurora is very confusing. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) He's hitting Aurora with those lightning bolts now, to the point that she is now on fire. 
Cool. Yikes. Finally, Nightcrawler steps in, bamfing away with his friend into the sea to extinguish the flames while Colossus runs interference. Mag's ready to crumple Piotr like a tin can when suddenly he senses the disruption of his computer's delicate memory core. <laughs> what? How? Magnets. Metal. Magnets, baby. I... Yeah. She's fucking with his hard drive. Um, uh, okay. <laughs> uh, he I senses get... a disturbance in the force. And the, the in the force that is his computer. Yeah. He knows someone is messing with his computer. Yes. Realizing the play, he immediately abandons the fight, headed off to stop Kitty. And he doesn't arrive subtly either. Rather, he blasts the wall in and then crosses the room to seize the young lady by the arms, howling with rage about how the X-Men are always there to stop him. Kitty tries to phase her way free of his grip when suddenly he zaps her with a jolt of electricity and the child goes limp in his arms. Aww. It's only after the deed is done that Magneto comes to his senses, realizing what he'd done. How could he have attacked a child? He thinks of a lot of things. Of how his wife left after he responded to the death of his daughter with lethal, lethal force. He thought of his own childhood in the camps at Auschwitz. And, how, and now he has the blood of this child, this mutant child, on his hands when all he ever wanted was to make a world safe for kids like her. When Aurora arrives, Magneto is cradling the girl's body and doesn't so much as lift a finger to defend himself. And that's enough to at least stop Aurora's instant fury. I mean, he asked for death, practically. And he explains that he was so caught up with fervor for his dream that he lost sight of the innocents who would die in the process. He then passes a miraculously still living Kitty Pride over to Aurora (laughs) and makes his getaway. Which means it's time for the beach party! <laughs> what? Uh, what? Uh, so, <laughs> they're just, like, cool with him now, or what? No, he got away. Oh. He ran away, I didn't Th- mention that. They let okay. him? He, he, ran, he got away, and then they had a beach well, party. Well, Aurora let him get away because he had a change of heart, I guess, and she's, like, got compassion damn it <laughs> damn that compassion he'd be dead by now if it weren't we for don't want him to be dead magneto was right god damn it <laughs> magneto was right they've got about a night before the yacht's gonna be ready to sail again so that just leaves the blackbird after a while some of the x-men notice kitty with her face screwed up trying to figure out how to raise the bird from the reef below Suddenly, to the shock of the waiting X-Men, they realize the fins of the plane really have broken the water. Mm -hmm. It begins to rise out of the water. It's only after a few moments that the X-Men realize they've been had as Colossus emerges from beneath the plane, hafting it up out of the water, Mm -hmm. which gets Kitty dumped in the water for her prank. (laughs) (laughs) It's a pretty good prank. How do y'all like that? Um, five. It was very fun. That was good. It was very good. It finally got, it finally actually made that B story into the story. Yep, it's the story. Good. What did you rate it? Yeah, I'm going to f- five-ish, yeah. I'm around a five. What do you think CMRO thought? Four. Two. <laughs> they hated it, yeah. 4.45, so okay. it got a lot of fives. Yes, yeah. it did. But that's it for the X-Men half of the show, so let's get into our stuff. Please hit all the buttons. We would love that. The like button's good. The subscribe button, even better. The bell button, pretty fucking cool. Let's you know when we put out stuff. Would be sweet. Catch us over on our socials. We're on Tumblr, Jeter, <laughs> Facebook, Instagram, Blue Sky. Um, those are all places you can find us. <laughs> In theory. Us, in theory. If you want to throw us a couple bucks, we're on coffee, so that's cool. Join us over on our Discord. We include a link every week in the description. Join us in the discard pile. Mm-hmm. And on with the show. So this is the time we would normally get into Thor. Um, but we actually have a very special... And late extra feature that John has prepared for us. Uh-huh. Um, 
And a little bit of backstory on this is that um, we have a Patreon. We have never had, like, subscribers to our Patreon. We had Robin. We had Robin for a time. Um, and yet, despite this, Ripley insisted that we have, we regularly create bonus content. And that's what I did. For the Patreon, so that we could, you know, if people were looking at it, they would see that we were actually delivering the product, right? Yeah. Um, so we assigned John to doing the bonus episodes, and that was generally just kind of like looking at really dumb and bad, legendarily legendarily bad. bad comics. The ratings on some of these on CMRO are uh, like when we say we've read a bad comic. No, no, <laughs> no. When when we think we've read a bad Thor, no, we haven't. We um, haven't read a bad Thor. So, yeah, and one of those that we did was a Super Bowl special. Well, we actually didn't read the Super Bowl special. Super Bowl special. Okay, okay. So, <laughs> Our Super Bowl special. Our ah. Super Bowl special. No, annoyingly, this has a Super Bowl special, too. That's, of course uh, it does. That's, so we're talking uh, about NFL Super Pro, of course. We read the first issue last year for the Super Bowl, and we decided we wanted to do the second issue because it's just really dumb and fun. Check um, our channel for the old one. We're putting it up. We are going to get that posted. Um, yeah, and then we didn't plan it very well because no one thought of it until like. <laughs> also, I was sick all uh, most of j early January. So like we know the Super Bowl was technically last week when this is going up, but whatever, we're doing it anyway. It's that. For a bowel. It's that time of year, and okay, I gotta cr correct something. First things first, uh... Oh yeah, we realized. fucked up, didn't we? We did. Uh, it turns out, uh, the Super Bowl special is actually the origin story. Yeah. Now, it's it's an understandable mistake. This is usually how... It's, it's, it's an extra length, and you'd normally think, Oh, that's the uh, annual, or special, or whatever, and those always come after the series. Not this time. Yeah, we fucked up. But it doesn't matter because it, it looks it really does look like the story could be boiled down to that one page. Any right. complaints we had about why is this not the origin story of Super Pro are now rendered moot. Yeah, we uh, um. I me going. Th I've uh, paged through it. It doesn't look like a fun even <laughs> record. Never All mind. you need to <laughs> know is there was like a fire and. <laughs> The guy, he got, like, some special football armor because there was a fire. And now he solves football crimes. Oh, yes. Also, because of the fire, it <laughs> gave him superpowers somehow. Uh, yes, his one, the once-in-a-lifetime uh, chemical the, combination. The chemical combination of burning sports memorabilia yeah. and turned him into super pro. <laughs> yes, specifically, <laughs> specifically, and I quote, a once-in-a-lifetime chemical combination. Okay, so... With all that uh, background out of the way, John, please tell us. Spin us a tale. Okay. Uh, when quick kick is on offense, there is no defense. What does that mean? Is that supposed to mean something? I give you NFL Super Pro number two from November 1991. Ooh. Now, since this is a semi-canon... Uh, uh, element to our uh, show. We're not. I'm not going deep into the uh, weeds on the, the uh, credits, but it was written by Fabian Nicesa, uh pencils by Jose Delbo, Mike DiCarlo on inks, Ron Friends, and Joe Sinat. Uh, we know Joe Sinat uh, on cover artists. Hey, duty. We're going to know Ron Friends. Uh, oh, nice! I'm <laughs> glad. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad they touched this thing. Yep. This episode? <laughs> no. Oh. In the future. Uh, okay. Evelyn Stein on colors and Jancy uh, Chang on uh, letters. Janice. Uh, Janice Chang on letters. So, important detail that I also learned. Fabian says I only stayed on for four of these. Oh. Uh, oh. How many are there? Twelve. Hmm. <laughs> He only needed tickets to four games. True. <laughs> he only needed tickets for the season, and there's 12 of them. Yeah. The, uh, uh, another fun fact, 
they get worse when he leaves. Oh, boy. That seems impossible. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, They don't stick around with a consistent writer. Uh, So the fact is, the, the first four actually make a bit of a solid story arc. Right. And Based around that guy that they were trying to kill? Yes. Well, he, there's a bad guy. Deep in the background. Well, don't spoil it. We're going to no, you saw get him. to that. You saw him. Okay. You did see, Look, I promise, even if you don't remember him... Yeah, this was like a year ago. You so. uh, oh, saw year Marco... Ago, I think. You saw Marco uh, Sanzia... Sanzianare. <laughs> Sanzianare. That yeah, is quite you, a name. You saw him. You That's s- like... He's... I remember ma- I remember doing that to his name. That's like... There it is. That's like Japanese, Spanish, Italian. <laughs> <laughs> now we begin issue two. The Killer Instinct. The year is 1985. The place is Notre Dame University. And Greyfield, our hero, was still playing football. Phil Greyfield, right? Yes. Oh, yeah. shit. We have a name. Phil Greyfield. Yes, I looked it up. Notre Dame's colors are blue and white. Blue, not purple. Mm. But Greyfield has tackled someone else and the ball has been fumbled. For those who don't know, a fumbled ball is one that anyone can grab and whoever get it gets it. It's now their turn to go on the offense. Somebody grab the egg. Grab the sports <laughs> egg. Yes, grab the sports egg. Uh, the next page confirms that Greyfield was playing for Notre Dame. I think it's probably just a really bad blue. <laughs> uh, actually, yeah. it's worse than that. I, I checked. Uh, they're... they're their uniform should be blue, not white. Mm. They're, he's, if, if they're at Notre Dame and he's playing for Notre Dame, he should be wearing home colors. And that that's blue and white with a blue with white lettering, not right. blue. Right, white lettering. on blue, not blue on white. Yes. Got it. So, so why are so, they wearing... Well, uh, is, is there a home versus an away uniform? Yep. Yeah. Most teams have that, I yeah. think. And uh, he's wearing... Okay, assume they can't afford the blue. He, they're, he's wearing the away colors at home. <laughs> okay, that's our problem. Yes. Now, to be fair, while I suspect Fabian Nicesa knows these things, I'm not so sure uh, Mike DiCarlo is aware of this. Yeah. Fabian probably knows this. I gotta say, I like the art, though, on this. Look, that's, yeah. that's the thing. It's actually well drawn. It, 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 it's well depicted. This was, there was effort put into this. Mm-hmm. But this is very dynamic football man work. Yes, oh, yeah. it is. Greyfield gets the ball. He gets it. Ooh. And he has it. And in the announcer's booth, we have Jane Dixon, future former girlfriend, talking about, <laughs> <laughs> well, this is the past. And it's, that's, uh, Wikipedia refers to her as his former girlfriend. Uh-huh. And so this is her... It's the future, future former girlfriend. girlfriend. Yeah, I got a song I listened to like that's pre-ex girlfriend. God. <laughs> and she's talking about how good he is, not just on the field, if you know what I mean. I mean, is he, he has a good GPA, Excuse obviously. Me. Excuse me. Yeah. This is inappropriate commentary. <laughs> I think the mic is off, and she's just I'm, talking to her. I'm reasonably confident. Having a cheeky oh, conversation I see. with her coworkers. Just being cheeky. Yeah, yeah. No, no. They're 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 uh, transmitting that to the whole On field. On the mic, yeah. if you know what I mean. They're they're the mic. ladies. <laughs> um, but uh, he's taken. Jane, Jane. The mic was hot. <laughs> oh God! Now I'm gonna have competition because that dick game too good. <laughs> but still more, at least. Yeah, stew. You can keep note of that. Uh, <laughs> stew. Stew. Number 42 is pissed because apparently Greyfield wasn't sticking to the plan, even Number if what he did stew. work. <laughs> but look at him. He's pissed. The two are out here having an argument, but it looks like their coach doesn't care and just wants them to shut up. <laughs> Fair. Uh, later, Moore goes for an interception, but... Just as it seems the pass is complete to number 40, Greyfield knocks him over before he can get the ball. He tries to give Moore some advice, but Moore just isn't having it. Oh, there's a rivalry brewing. Oh, yeah. Or we got stewing. A, we got a sports oh. ball rivalry here. 
After the game, Moore is in the locker room, trying to recall every play of the game. He's obsessing, and it doesn't sound uh, particularly healthy. Yeah, this seems like a really good thing to do. I'm going to jot down all of my sports beefs. It, this, he, he's perfectly normal. This is normal. It's fine. It's perfectly fine. It's not fine. <laughs> oh, boy. Suddenly, we're in the future, and more is a ninja now? Oh, He's the Afro Ninja. Yeah, yeah, it's 1991. Um, important to mention, this man is black, which puts the way he is very... Aggro. Aggro into... Oh, God, I hadn't even thought to mention he was black. Yeah. Well, yeah, because you're just like, oh, it's a guy. It's, he's they just have a done guy. a great job coloring him, though. Oh, they yeah, have. and, like, you can see tones on Oh, these. they very, very specifically wanted this man to be black. Not just him, but, like, there's a lot of black people in this, pan- in this page, and they put tones into their skin. Yeah. I'm so gotten so accustomed to the monotone past. <laughs> That even though this is a terrible You comic, didn't recognize they were black because they're not gray. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. If they were gray, they would be from uh, the Middle Egypt. East. Yeah. True. Or Saudi Arabia, of course. Yes. And if you look close, you can see he actually has a pair of nunchucks wrapped around another man's neck. You have to look real close, but there's actually a chain. Yeah, I see it. I mean, it would be weird if... Yeah, I had actually... This guy was just floating while he held a stick on his throat. <laughs> I did not see them at first, so I actually had to look up what yeah. the heck he was doing. Yeah. And then I realized, oh, there's No, a I chain. definitely, I see how you could miss that. Yeah, sure. yeah. I can't see it from here. I can see my house from Let's here. See, uh, ah. I can see Russia from my house. <laughs> uh, do you live near Russia? No. <laughs> That's a neat trick. <laughs> You must have great eyesight. Yes. Yeah, that's why I can't see the fucking nunchucks <laughs> from here. Uh, you're, exactly. You only you, you need glasses, but not for what you have. You're extremely farsighted. Yes. <laughs> Moore asks why, and the poor guy seems to just have been trying to protect their neighborhood. Moore, on the other hand, is just trying to protect his business interest. With a crack. Our would-be hero is seemingly killed, and we learn that Stu Moore is now going by Quick Kick, and is the boss of this group. And is also a ninja. Yes. Uh, Stu's mook, named Sammy, seems to recognize one of the people they've got on their hands. He's a football player for the Dolphins. Stu tells him to correct his tenses. Was. Was a football player. (laughs) God, I really like the art on this fucking book. The art is good. Man. They they put effort into getting Fabian tickets on. Yeah. Right. He wanted those fucking tickets, man. <laughs> <laughs> and it turns out shooting a football player in Miami will make it onto the news. No well, sure. At least if it's a Miami football right. player. And on the Miami Tribune. <laughs> And this gets Phil on the case. So on the case that he's using an FBI contact. Why does a football player turned sports reporter turned superhero have an FBI contact? No matter. He's here to fight crime against sports. Mm -hmm. (laughs) He's here to protect the great American sport of fubo. Yes. Football is under threat and he (laughs) won't rest. A dark night. (laughs) He smashes in a door, expecting to get some answers from some more mooks, who have no idea who he is. (laughs) With a sigh, uh, he explains who he is, uh, and how his NFL branding makes it obvious why he's fighting crime against this one specific sport. (laughs) It's very niche. All he gains is the name Tight End Man, and then Tackled. He does explain why our our shot Miami Dolphin was involved with the local gangs, but was this a thing? Did sports players try to get gangs to cool it? Mm. I don't know, but that seems like it might have been a 90s thing. Yeah. I wasn't old enough in the 90s to know. I I don't know, but I'm willing to believe that it was. If it wasn't a thing, then I am very willing to believe that it's just like... Something that people would say is a thing. 
<laughs> it's a plausible thing. You're right. The two goons who went in for the tackle go down, and tight end man grabs a guy and wants to know which gang has the most to lose from a sports ball player. I think that's a better name for him. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, that's that's why I stuck with, stick with it. <laughs> That's it. I'm sticking with it because it's a good name. Tight end man. And his question apparently has an answer. Los Tiburones. Los Tiburones. A.K.A. the Sharks. Oh. Wow, the Sharks took down the Dolphin, huh? Yes. Um, but what about the Jets? Uh, I, <laughs> what about them? <laughs> When you're a jet, you're a jet. <laughs> Copyright claimed. Uh, yeah, because it was too perfect. <laughs> exactly. I'll accept that for some performances, but not that one. <laughs> <laughs> Our hero thinks to himself, it's a start. And I have to wonder what kind of community outreach program would have this much of an effect on a gang that they would kill a guy, but... It's quite clear that Titan Man is really only <laughs> in it because of the shot man was good at football. Yeah. He's really, really only in it for the football. It's exclusively dialed in on sports crimes. <laughs> Fuck all you other people. <laughs> None of you matter. That said, we finally get an acknowledgement of our hero's man in the van and said van. And his awesome haircut. Oh my god, I... Yes! 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 The haircut is still just as incredible. Ken Reed and Phil have a little back and forth about what Phil learned. Uh, while Ken is hunting on 1991 Google for anything he can find out about the gang activities. And it turns out our shot football players outreach program was, was actually discouraging kids from joining gangs. Well, we can't have that. Yeah, that's not acceptable. We need more children in our gang. Uh, but he's not dead. We need to make that point. He's not dead. The football player is not dead. <laughs> Shot. Not dead. Oh, okay. Well, you know, that is... Wait, going... I thought it said he was slain. Uh, I mean... Having a gunshot wound is... No, it just said he was shot. Okay. I, I made the same mistake you did when I was reading this. <laughs> so... But yeah, uh, I very much made the mistake about I thought he was killed. I don't there was more work put in the art than there was into the writing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but I feel like having a gunshot wound is probably not great for your sports career. No. Yeah, no, I think he's done. Yeah. He's probably done. You think he's done. retiring? Yeah. You know, presuming he's not retired from life. Of course. He's not. We well, know. Yeah, well, I know so far. <laughs> right. But, you know, they actually weren't here to fight crime, believe it or not. They were here to do a sports inside piece on the shot player. Gee, this won't be <laughs> suspicious. Uh, but yes, it turns out that... I mean, this is even more suspicious <laughs> than fucking Peter Parker, because there, <laughs> there are superheroes everywhere you turn around New York City. Yeah. Running into a superhero when you're on the crime beat, not a huge fucking shock, right? Running into exclu Running into places where Super Pro is exclusively when you do your sports stories seems like it would be a little bit of a tip-off. Yeah. Especially since he's not even, like, in the same place every time. Weren't mm. they up in, like, Philly last time? Oh, God, they were, weren't they? But see, this is actually even more personal for Phil because he sees that Miami Dolphin as a perfect role model. And how dare you shoot a perfect role model. What will the kids think? <laughs> They'll think it's cool to join gangs now. <laughs> <laughs> Ken seems to think Phil's not alone in that opinion, because police records show the FBI has gotten involved, and now Phil needs to go to his local source. Mm. His source in the FBI? Yes. You know, actually, I assume that, but now that I think about it, it doesn't actually say that he goes back to the FBI source. It, he just says local source. So, I mean, I would assume it's the one that they already talked about but before. Fabian, your writing is ambiguous enough that I wasn't. I thought the man was sh was killed, not shot. <laughs> and now I'm wondering if the source is the same source from before. Yeah, it's not great. You and you're the high point of this comic. <laughs> 
you, of the writing in this comic, because the high point is the art. Well, don't I worry, we'll get back to football, Fabian. <laughs> I can't wait until we get to the bad part of this comic, um, like, four, <laughs> four years from now. If we're still doing this four years from now, uh, we're, we're going to be experiencing some things. Five years ago, six years ago, years, years ago, six years from now, seven years from now, we're going to experience things. Okay, well, tell me about... This right now. Well, this right now, uh, uh, it's shark's territory, and a man is going out a window. Cool. Uh, Stu is beating the life out of the sharks. Mm -hmm. That's it. That's all that's happening. Okay, I was going to ask if it was a jet, but I guess he's a shark. (laughs) Yeah. No, he's... These are the sharks. Los Tiburones. No, the... Ninja Stu is... He's not. He's not either of He's those. not actually one of the uh, gangs. Yeah. He's just... Loose cannon. He got He's his own business. Got his own agenda. Yeah. A lone wolf. Yeah. Seems uh, the shark stole some guns and Stu is here to find them and dish out punishment for the theft. The kind of punishment you don't walk away from. The sound effects are to be believed. Oh boy. <laughs> Shink. I. <laughs> Well, he does have a sword, so... Yeah, he's, he's killing people. Because he's a ninja. Yeah. The next morning, our men in the van find their way to the outreach center run by the Miami Dolphin. At the very least, doing a report on this was the job they were here for, and Marissa Delgado is keeping the lights on, uh, managing the different aspects of the, the center, from youth daycare to bilingual tutoring... Who is Marissa Delgado? To this, this lady. Si- well, yeah, but to this situation, is she the person who's actually in charge when the football player isn't, or is she just stepping in? You know, I, I'm going to hazard a guess she probably is the actual, actual person who runs the place. Whereas yeah. the footballer is the money. Yeah. Makes sense And to the me. face. Yeah. Because, oh no, I just noticed. Our, our... Yeah, there's some coloring problems. Yeah. That's okay. It's not the worst thing in the world. True, true. Because at least her skin tone is the right shade of brown. I mean, it's kind of a little grayish. It is. But it's not the worst in the world. They even do elderly work programs of some kind that sound a little weird. (laughs) They're having them fill out flyers and bulletins and brochures. Is this free labor? Our Miami Dolphin used to be in a street gang, but he got away because he was good at football. Not everyone is, though, so he made this place. A place for uh, even boys who were former members of the Blood Tigers. The Blood Tigers? The Blood Tigers. The Blood Tigers. These boys who were former who are former members of the Blood Tigers. I mean, that does sound like what like a bunch of teenagers would call their gang. <laughs> Well, that's what they did. Yep. It's it's kind of a badass name, too. Blood Tigers. Blood Tigers. If you're 14. Yes, if you're 14 and you have a gun. <laughs> Speaking of, uh, Phil decides to ask the Blood Tigers, well, I, I'm sorry, former Blood Tigers, uh, a few questions. They might be out, but they still know a thing or two. Like, how the sharks stole some guns from some mob boss, and wants them back. But when Phil asks where the guns are, he gets a no habla inglés for his trouble. From a kid who was speaking English a minute ago. Correct. So. (laughs) Yes. yes. Pleading the fifth. Definitely. Mm Mm-hmm. But it's not that hard to talk the boys into spilling the beans. Guilt about how that Miami Dolphin made this outreach center for them goes pretty far. Next stop. We're off. Next stop. Uh, Shulman Airport in Hallandale, wherever that is. Phil and Ken try to piece together the parts of this gun theft, and Ken thinks that, as the Sharks are a Cuban gang, maybe the guns are being smuggled to Cuba? Hmm. Phil gets dressed in a silly outfit during (laughs) and doesn't really care that much about where the guns are going, so much as beating their trip out. Fair, I guess. But he is getting dressed in a silly outfit. Well, yeah. Hours later, there's a fight at Shulman Airport. Well, I say fight. Stu is just beating the ever-loving crap out of a bunch of guys. Yeah. All to rescue the shipment for his boss. Which he does. Until... 
until Phil is on the scene. Uh, there to make Stu go to jail to make himself happy. Yes, this is all for him. He's doing this for him. At least, at least Phil knows why he's doing it. It's not like Stu recognizes him. Uh, well, hang, hang on, I'm getting some names mixed up. Uh, no, wait, we'll get there, we'll get there. They don't recognize each other because why would they? Who's ever seen Super Pro? <laughs> Alright, so Stu and Phil were rivals on the field. Uh-huh. He, does he recognize Stu? Uh, F- Stu I think recognizes some... Phil and then introduces himself as Carl Moore. There's some shenanigans at play. Yeah. Well, yeah. Carl I see that. Moore. No, I see that. But... And if we go back, Phil called him Stu. Oh, and, uh, his name was never Stu! And uh, our Carl didn't seem to have a problem with that. Uh, Maybe that's why he hates him so fucking much. Oh my god, you know, I think that's fair, honestly. I, I think it's fair too, but also uh, it tells you Fabian didn't care enough to keep track of that guy's name. <laughs> I think about it that way. I'm sorry, Fabian, but you... For a second, I thought this was like a twin brother seeking vengeance. No, no, this is this is <laughs> Stu, aka Carl. They, he rem- <laughs> hey, he he keeps his last name. Uh, the coach called him more. Right. But I got confused as hell when I saw this because yeah. I I'd been writing his name down as I'd written his name down as Stu Moore, and then he introduces himself as Carl. Right. I prefer Stu because I can make a lot more puns with Stu than Carl. And also, we have a Carl. That's true. And Carl is... Carl. We know Carl. Carl's a different, a different asshole. <laughs> Carl does a dress... Our Carl does not dress up as a ninja. Yes. Because that's weird. <laughs> Our Carl carries around a wrecking ball. That's fine. It doesn't matter because... Stu, a.k.a. Carl, is <laughs> neither of those things anymore. Now he's just called Quick Kick, which, as he says, is what is synonymous with a quick death. Uh, okay. okay. <laughs> uh, that's dumb. Also, Quick Kick is a bad name because those words... I know, I am aware. You know why else Quick Kick is a dumb name? Because it has nothing to do with being a fucking ninja! Yeah. Uh, and I don't think he kicked the ball in football no he didn't he he was he wasn't a kicker no they, they even mentioned special teams going on the field <laughs> this is yeah it's just uh, fabian fabian <laughs> fabian you're you're it's hurting me done yeah it's not like the art is bad the art's really good yeah uh, you, you know what i don't know how uh his name works but he's throwing ninja stars. His name's oh. Carl now. <laughs> so we're just going to take him seriously. For now. <laughs> We'd love to know how he got into this line of work. Will uh, he tell us? No. God! He was just so angry <clears throat> that Phil was um, mean to him, I guess. Phil kept calling him the wrong name. <laughs> that he snapped and just decided to become a ninja. You know what? That's as good a theory as uh, any. any. Because I promise you we're never going to find out his backstory. That You know what? I'm completely fine with that. <laughs> I'm good with that. Let's roll on. Uh, Phil, who would prefer not to die, uh, takes a quick kick down with a leap. With a quick kick. Yes. <laughs> Only to somehow have him not be down. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not sure what happens <laughs> on this panel. Not sure. Yeah, that doesn't seem to uh, phase him much because he's right up. back up on his feet again. Yeah. yeah, this doesn't look like an artistic breakdown, to be honest. Yeah, doesn't look like bad art. It looks like they didn't have anything to work with for what they were supposed to do. Yeah, I think this is a writing breakdown. I think they were told to have him standing mm-hmm. after getting kicked in the chest. I like his little backflip into kicking. It is neat. That's a lot. <laughs> the fact is, this is a Thor-Loki fight. 
an old Thor Loki fight. Because what they're really fighting over is how good Mr. Kick was at football. Oh my god. He was the best. He is the best. Yeah, yeah, no, this is this is at its core an old Thor fight from mm-hmm. the yep. fucking Silver Age. No, I completely understand what you're saying. <laughs> Fabian. And oh yeah, uh you know how he's the best? He's also really easy to flip. Mm-hmm. But he's not down for the count. He started with a ninja star, moved to nunchucks, and now uh, breaks out of katana. All p- uh, part of the raging inferno, fueled by his hatred of Phil. Mm-hmm. Oh, we've, we've got some ominous Raiders of the Lost Ark situation going on here. It's not what you think. Oh, good. <laughs> I... But I had that exact same <laughs> thought. Oh, yeah, this cargo plane is literally just, like, running right now. It is. The plane is running. I figured you'd notice that and yeah, say something about it, because there's no way you don't get Raiders. <laughs> Raiders vibes, yeah. Mm-hmm. But as Phil pushes Mr. Kick through some oil drums, he rightly states that he's not responsible for everything that went wrong in the uh, college football player turned ninja's life. <laughs> Yeah. See, the guns are on the plane. Mm-hmm. And with the motor running, it didn't really matter until one of the uh, oil drums knocked out the wheel jams, and now the plane is free to roam about the airport. Oh, great. <laughs> and that's Quick Kick's paycheck rolling away, so he's going after it. He actually makes it onto the plane with <laughs> Phil in pursuit, and he's even able to kick the football hero uh, back, but he breaks a part of the wing in the process. Yeah, like the support yeah. strut thing. Yeah. Uh-oh. <laughs> this is very much a thing Phil tells him, but Quick Kick won't listen. The plane loses control, crashing into what we can assume is the Atlantic, though I suppose it could be the Gulf of Mexico. I, again, did not research which side of Florida <laughs> this is Miami supposed to be on. Miami is on the Atlantic side. Yes, but the airport could be uh, on the Gulf side. It yeah. did say ours. I'm not remotely confident that Fabian knew what body of water this That's was crashing true. into. True. So, so I'm not. I'm not putting more effort into this than Fabian did. Yeah. And the airport fire and police are on the scene, but it's too le- late. Funny enough, the cop just accepts that uh, a super pro stopped an arms shipment and killed an assassin, and he tells Phil that he did a good job. Is my normal? No. No. <laughs> Is that a question you need to ask? I'm going to Miami. Okay. Uh, but Phil's not too happy about not getting arrested. No. He fought a man and lost. A man who was too much like himself. Was um, he? I, I wasn't aware that Phil was like an uncontrollable rage monster. No, that's, hey, that's what he says. He's saying it. He's telling the cop. What a great guy. <laughs> uh, a man who was too much like himself and a man who... A man, he couldn't show what you should really fight for. But hey, man in the van, Ken, is there to tell him that even if he lost the battle, he still won the war. Especially since the Miami Dolphin they were here for is out of the ICU and he's going to make it. All right. Great. So now he's just going into regular retirement. (laughs) Probably. And there's our archvillain. Oh, San Zinare. Somewhere off the coast of Florida, probably in international waters, in a yacht that looks more like a cruise ship, Marco Sanzionore receives a message that his cargo is in federal hands and that Quick Kick is probably dead. Oh, and that Super Pro did it. Marco flies into a rage. This is the second time Super Pro has foiled one of his schemes and he won't have it reach a third time. That's why he's sending instant replay after him. Uh. No one can kill Super Pro, Pro faster than... Uh, the killer who can cut through time. Okay, so we've got a villain who's got, like, actual superpowers. Cool. Uh-huh. And that's a... That's a... A teaser for our next, next Super, Super Bowl, Bowl special. special. Next year. <laughs> so what did you think of that issue? Bad. Uh, bad. Really bad. Quite really bad. Out, what out of uh, five? One and a half. Huh? One and a half out of five. Negative three out of five. What do you think CMO, CMRO rated this? I'm, I'm, 1.81. I'm going to say somewhere between one and two for sure. 
Okay, that's a cop out. Give, well, give, be, you want an exact decimal point? No. <laughs> give high or low. Pick one. Um, high, middle, or low. High. One point eight one. Yeah. One point four one. Ooh. I, I want, hated it. I want you to know that this series has lower, much lower. Oh, oh my boy. god. This, this series has a, about as close to one as I think is possible. As close to a true one. <laughs> Holy shit. Yes. They said it was a myth, a legend. Uh-huh. Said it couldn't be done. You said that a true I, one I or a true five was, was impossible. I and did, you're right. In fact, it's impossible. That. But you can get close. So yeah, that covers uh, a <laughs> Alright. Well that was our Super Bowl special. Oh. We hope you guys enjoyed that. Now we still are going to talk about Thor. <laughs> On with the show! On with the show. Can you guys tell me what happened last time with Thor? Oh, good lord, no. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so... Uh, this, the Egyptian gods? Thor yep. showed up to fucking... California. Thor showed up, no, he didn't show up to California yet, because first he went to Asgard, and uh-huh. everybody there was in a real funk, yep. feeling bad in a daze. Feels bad, man. So Thor showed up, kicked down the door to his dad's house and yelled at his friends. <laughs> yep. Oh, right, because he's kind of a bad friend He right was now. just, he was in a mood. And then they realized <laughs> that, okay, well, we gotta get Odin back to Asgard, because without him, Asgard is dying? Question, question mark? mark. <laughs> yes, the, que- heavy on the question mark, because... Why? Either it's that very. Or the flu is tearing through Asgard, it's very, and everybody's just being really dramatic about it. It's very weird and vague, and never explained. Because no. uh, I think the next issue is by a different writer. Uh so yeah, so he goes off to California, where Odad is, and he finds that Odin has been hypnotized by the Egyptian gods to turn him into Atom Ra. Father of the gods. Yeah. So, so he can, can be s- their father instead of his. Yeah. Right, so they can stop Seth. Real Seth, not Seth too. Yeah. So they can stop Seth from doing things? Question mark, question well, mark, question so mark. So they can, like, because Seth already kind of defeated them and, like, took over their godly domain, I guess. So they just needed Autumn Ray to take their shit back. Basically. So first they fought what they fought he fought the gods but then he just fought with the gods. Uh-huh. Uh Jane was also here throughout all of this. I know Odin recognized Sif's soul within her even though she was doing fuck all which I guess makes sense why he recognized <laughs> Sif's, Sif's soul then. Yeah, that yep. sounds about right. Um, Tracks. And then they were fighting instead with the Egyptian gods now, like, with side by side, not against. Because the Egyptians basically said, if you help us, we'll give you your dad back. <laughs> so he did. And they did. Yep, and they beat Seth, and he got flung out into space. Yep. To go do... To his home planet? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To just... Float around aimlessly. Float around aimlessly inside this fucking pyramid. Anyway, so they're gonna take the pyramid out of there, but Odad has learned nothing from his time in humanity. No, that's not true. He did learn stuff. He just doesn't like Jane specifically. Yeah, so he's pissed off that he sees Jane, and he immediately yells at Jane and... Thor, I guess. Yeah, he banished Thor again. Because again. because when he was talking to uh, his fellow cult leader, <laughs> he thanked her for all the stuff she did. Well, when they got back, they found out that the Warriors 3 were hanging out inside of Jane's apartment. Well, because the door got broken down, so... Right, exactly. There was nothing to keep them from no going in. to stop that. So... That happened, and then there was a robot outside, and the robot stole Jane, and then they fought the robot, but it turns out that the robot, Servitor, was not, like, actually a problem. He was actually here trying to get him to talk to his boss, who is Zarko, the Tomorrow Man. Everybody's favorite Thor villain. Yes, who was (laughs) created because Magneto won his little, uh, (laughs) war of, uh, weapons with the world. Yep. Yep. 
So that's what happened. Yeah, I mean, that's more or less. You skipped over a few details, but nothing super important. Sorry, I couldn't oh, remember God. them. My fucking... We are going to find out what's going on with all that nonsense in Thor number 243 from October of 1975, written by Len Wein, penciled by John Buscema, inked by Joe Sinnott, colored by Glynis Wein, lettered by Joe Rosen, and the cover art is by Gil Kane and Joe Sinnott. Oh, wow. Joe Sinnott. Yeah. <laughs> I told you we know Joe. What a s- story we are, career. We are familiar with his work. I know. I, rem- I, re- I remembered him. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, wait, wait, I know that name. So, the appearance of Zarko has done absolutely nothing to defuse the situation. <laughs> I'm shocked. And quite to the contrary, Thor seems more on guard than before. That's fair. Frankly, I'm surprised he even remembers who this clown is. Uh, Because I didn't. (laughs) But I guess he did just announce himself at the end of the last issue, so maybe he's just, like, rolling with it, like, oh, yeah, Zarko. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I remember you. Who's this guy? Were you here for this? Were any of you here for this? Do you know who this guy is? Well, I'll kick your ass again, Zarko. Did did I kick his ass before? I don't remember. I did kick his ass, right? I did do that, right? I mean, I usually do that, but I want to be sure. Because if I say I'm going to kick his ass again, I want it to be right about it. It might be awkward if I'm wrong. Yeah. Anyway, Zarko reiterates that he has come to ask for help saving the world. Fandral thinks he's lying and wants to jump straight into beating his ass. Fair. But the Odinson at least wants to hear the pitch before they decide how good it is. I, I guess. Zarko explains that after his extremely embarrassing defeat, <laughs> he decided that his own year in the 30th century was too hard to take over, and he needed an even easier target. <laughs> So he stole a giant mining robot, which is apparently a thing in the 30th century, and modified it for combat, and made it a Spartan for some reason. (laughs) Oh. Um, And then he and his servitor entered the time cube. What? (laughs) Has has this been a thing at all ever? No! Okay, okay. That's not what he even had before. (laughs) I don't remember him. I'm sorry. He's not that memorable. They entered the time cube um, as if, and like it's stated as if that's a thing we're just supposed to know about. (laughs) And they aimlessly traveled through time until they arrived in the 50th century, where Zarko was able to immediately take over the world and subjugate the rest of humanity, complete with scantily clad serving girls in his shiny palace. Huh. Well, that's, so, that's unexpected. That went well for him. Problems arose, however, when he discovered the exi- existence of the Time Twisters. Oh, God. <laughs> Which sounds like a cheesy 80s sci-fi film. The fact that um, <laughs> there's a football hero in the 90s and this man exists in the same canon is hurting my brain. <laughs> So, he explains the situation by drawing in the ground with his laser gun (laughs) that if humans experience time in a linear and progressive fashion, then the time twisters are doing more of a loop-de-loo in the opposite direction. Did you have to do that with a gun? What he had in his hand, I guess. If all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. So... Yes, they are called the Time Twisters because they literally twist through time. Just wanted to make that clear. Sure, I don't think I would have been too worried about it, but we'll we'll spend three panels explaining what they are. Every so often, they come into alignment with the timeline of Earth, and apparently they just destroy it? Zarko says that they appear every 30 centuries... And he watched them destroy the world in the 80th century, which means that the 50th century, where he's decided to chill, is the next on the chopping block, and then, of course, the 20th century. Wait, so they're going backwards through time? Yes. Yes. Ah. So, with this grave news, Thor, of course, agrees to help, as do the Warriors 3. 
Zarko commands his servitor to summon the time cube and urges the Asgardians to climb aboard. We then have another pointless conversation where Thor tells Jane to go home and she says no and he gives up immediately. <laughs> this has happened like three times now and honestly it's getting pretty old. Hasn't it? Not just three times, in like the last three issues. Yes, once per issue, for sure. Like... Yeah, we get it. Jane is more bold and adventurous. We don't need to keep bringing it up. But she's probably not going to do anything. We'll see. Meanwhile on Asgard, the vizier is showing this to Odin in a fairly transparent bid to get the Allfather to stop being angry for two seconds. <laughs> you may be shocked to find that it doesn't work. What? What? Odin continues to insist that he has no son until he breaks up with his girlfriend. You know, I, I appreciate that they have committed to giving Odin a new fit every time we see him. Yeah. Like, look, Stan isn't doing this anymore. Jerry isn't doing this anymore. We are well off of... This is, uh, this is John Buscema bringing that for us at this point. Which is great. Yeah. Because that's, that's a tradition that needs to stay alive <laughs> as long as possible. I know at some point they stop doing that. Yeah. And I'm uh, we are probably going to encounter that one day. Oh, yeah. And I'm going to be sad because I realized he doesn't have a new outfit. A new, silly, weird, brightly colored outfit that... No, we've run into that problem before. We have. But, we have. But he, Oh, we have? Yeah, but they've gotten back to form. Good. They've committed to it for now because I have not seen that outfit before. I know. It's... Terrible. Um, it's it's right. <laughs> so I love it. the vizier points out that Jane now has Sif's soul inside her, which maybe should tip the scales on the whole my son can't marry a mortal thing. We could make her not mortal, probably somehow. I mean, we tried to do that. And it we didn't tried go well. Well, it didn't go well because Odin rigged it. But <laughs> uh. <laughs> so Odin responds to that by confirming what we had basically already oh, guessed. Good Lord. It's not really about Jane anymore. It's about the fact that Odin commanded his son to do something and he refused to do it. So... That's an impressive face. Seth has been dealing with this bullshit for a while, right? <laughs> yes. Yep. And I think he's getting pretty sick of it. I mean, let's be real. <laughs> it seems like he does more actual day-to-day -day ruling yeah. than Odin does. He does most of the work, it seems. Yeah. Um... And that's why he pushes his luck a little further by suggesting that maybe, possibly, just perhaps, Odin may be making what some might call a mistake. Not him, of course. No, not, no, 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 no. Not him, but no, others no, no. in uh, Some Asgard. other people. <laughs> some other hypothetical people. There mm -hmm. are no actual people calling you wrong, mm -mm. sir. But, you know, maybe. Maybe someone... We should consider the possibility. Yes. Odin angrily insists that he knows exactly what he is doing, and the only thing that surprises me about this response is that he isn't banishing the vizier for daring to question him. Yeah, yeah. So returning to the time cube, it seems that we have eschewed the instant time travel method previously used, <laughs> and are now going for the traversing a swirling void because time is a physical space somehow. Okay, kind of thing. so it's a TARDIS. Yeah. But it's not bigger on the inside. No, it's just a big cube. This isn't an inherently bad idea, because, you know, comics are a visual medium, and time travel can be a good opportunity to do something fun and interesting and weird. Are they doing something fun, interesting, and weird? <laughs> so I think the part where this whole idea breaks down is when we start physically interacting with the time vortex... Because it's one thing to be drawn through, like, a crazy acid trip dimension that represents our inability to perceive time. I love crazy third... acid trips through weird space. Right, because we're third dimensional beings and, you know, it's another... I mean, Thor's already done some crazy acid trips Something that we can't really understand, but it's another thing entirely to act like there's some kind of time travel hallway that you can just walk through. Oh god, that, that was like a... Uh, wasn't there something called the Time Tunnel in, like, the 50s or something? I don't know. A show? Um, that I, was, yes. Okay. This Ripley sound, knows. This, sound, this, this is awakening memories in me. We've been recording for a long time, so let's <laughs> just, just keep going. And I bring this up because that is exactly what's about to happen. 
As everyone silently endures the trip, Volstagg, of course, is the first to ask how long this is going to take, because he isn't much enjoying flying through the incomprehensible vastness of time. <laughs> he is cut short, however, as the time cube suddenly comes under attack. Something is pounding on the outside of the vessel, impeding their voyage. Thor asks Zarko to open the hatch so that he can investigate. The Thunder God steps out into a strange and esoteric space where directionless mist floats off into oblivion and also forms solid pathways for him to walk on, apparently. And anyway, it's a T-Rex. <laughs> oh. Yeah, the thing attacking the ship is just a random T-Rex. Of course, Len makes some joke about being a thunder lizard and the irony being lost on Thor as he identifies it as a dragon before leaping forward to vanquish it. Okay. Okay. You kind of have a little fun. Yeah. With, um, but it's I not mean, a... Okay. Look, this, this, this comic has done psychedelic acid trips. Mm-hmm. Clouds. You know, if I could define this issue in a short phrase, I'd say they were definitely having fun with it. <laughs> the prehistoric beastie tumbles onto its back, but still reaches for the Thunder God with its snapping jaws and <laughs> deadly talons. It knocks him away, and the two combatants recover their footing to face each other once more. Lynn, a T-Rex only has two claws on each Arm. He doesn't fucking know that. What are you talking about? <laughs> I don't know. He, 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 he made him sound like he made himself sound like he knew about T Rexes. I don't think so. As the Dino advances, how I, how did he make himself sound like that? I don't know. Like he knew something about T. He he like because he knew the phrase Thunder Lizard. Yes. <laughs> As the dino advances, Thor delivers a swift end to the confrontation by hurling his hammer so hard that it carries the T-Rex far off into the folds of time where it disappears. And we get a little bit of a almost psychedelic swirl. Honestly, the backgrounds here are pretty fun. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I just wish they weren't on clouds. Yeah. Mjolnir returns to its master, of course, just before the Warriors 3 finally exit the ship to find the battle over. But wait, what's that over there? More? It's some very fucked up looking Mongol raiders. Oh god. Oh. Oh no. These guys look bad. This is unfortunate. The only good thing I can say for them is that they're not bright yellow. Yeah. But, but they... they aren't a good color either. No. Also, just like the entire facial structure is very yeah, bad. that's... Um, it's bad. We don't need to dwell on it. They these could guys look better. <laughs> these guys are here. They don't really matter. The servitor shows up, and all of them start fighting. Thor throws a few more guys into the void. Everything's going great, and hey, even Volstag's getting in on the action. What? Yeah. Volstag's actually fighting. <sighs> then the fight is cut off by a machine gun fire from a fighter plane. But Thor immediately throws me on there at it, and ex it explodes. But then some future guys on um, hoverbikes show up, and they have lasers and start shooting everyone. But Thor summons a big storm, and everyone gets blown away in a tornado. And they explode. Well, maybe not. This so. This is just a fight. <laughs> this is this is not just a fight. This is like the fever dream of like a twelve year. Like, a couple of 12-year-old boys who keep, like, trying to one-up each other in their yeah. game of pretend. Yeah, it is, isn't it? <laughs> well, what if, what if I send... What if I send that in after them? Yeah. No, then I'll send in that. That happened. Well, Thor blows <laughs> them up. That's yeah. what happens. Thor seems to get lost in the howling wind for a moment. Before his attention is drawn back to his friends, who all hit the deck so as not <laughs> to face the same fate as their enemies. And I think, having spent so long around Thor, this is probably just a thing that they know to do. Like, if Thor starts stamping his hammer, it's time to look for shelter. And if no shelter is available, lay flat on the ground and hold <laughs> on to your ass. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's just how you're supposed to react to storms, I suppose. <laughs> that's true. At the request of Fandral, the Odinson ends his gale, and they all return to the time cube to complete their journey. 
Zarko congratulates them all on, on a job well done, but Thor isn't in the mood for his bullshit. Mm-hmm. He asks where all those enemies came from, and Zarko replies that they came from time itself, which doesn't explain anything at all. But no. it looks like Thor accepts that. Yep, he's just like, all right, cool. <laughs> um, so the rest of their journey is pretty uneventful, and soon they disembark in the 50th century. The Asgardians are surprised to find not a gleaming utopia filled with advanced technology, but a squalid and destitute people making a meager living out of the ruins of a once great civilization. I I love the jank a chariot. Yeah. The time twisters have already been it lo- here. It looks like the front half of a car that's just been converted yep. to a chariot. So I guess Thor must have forgotten that Zarko is a bad guy. Because he asks why everything is so shitty. <laughs> but it's not, says Zarko. Just look at how my, how nice my palace is. <laughs> the Tomorrow Man starts to dazzle his guests with his wealth, but is interrupted by some citizens who want to know when the inner generators will be repaired. Apparently, when he was made king, it was with the understanding that he would fix the place up. By restoring power and other necessary utilities. Wait, so he just found it broken, uh, made some promises, and became king? That it, that That's kind of what it sounds like, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I would like you to hold on to that concept. Um, <laughs> he assures them that he's working on it before the servitor smacks the peasants away. And the Asgardians are starting to feel like maybe they have hitched their horse to the wrong wagon. But... Regardless, everyone settles into the palace, where Zarko brings out a bounty of food and drink and beautiful women. And that seems to be enough for them. It's playing to the crowd. I know it's a very silly thing to nitpick, but the thing that always bothers me when this happens is how the women are used as set dressing to emphasize how lavish the situation is. Like, they never talk. And never seem anything other than completely thrilled to be here and to flirt with people. And I guess you could argue that they're being paid, but I'm not entirely sure we can assume that. Yeah, you think he has money? (laughs) I I don't think he's going to give people money. But, you know, even if they were being paid, that really wouldn't excuse this laziness. And I know this is an obvious thing to point out, and we all know it's gross, but it happens a lot and I'm just getting sick of it. Lynn! Also... I thought they were in a hurry to save the world. Nah. Why, why do we have time to party? The warriors three quickly settle in with the help of some sexy lamps. <laughs> but Thor doesn't seem so easily placated. With Jane at his side, he questions whether Zarko's precious future is really worth saving. The Tomorrow Man then explains that by making sure his subjects don't have access to electricity, he ensures that they remain docile and unable to gather the power to overthrow him. Oh, fun! Which, like, that's a cool plan, and I guess I'm happy you thought about it that much, but that's not going to make Thor agree with you. Right. (laughs) Volstagg is actually the first to question whether the time twisters are even real. Mm. Or if Zarko is just manipulating them to his own benefit somehow. Why would he bring him to his palace if they weren't real? I don't know. You know, that might be an interesting twist, though. It... Um, but that's definitely not the case, as suddenly there is a strange light and, and several... Weird. Large-headed aliens appear seemingly in front of them on the balcony... The Time Twisters are here, and maybe we should have been planning how to deal with that instead of chilling. Yeah, maybe, maybe instead of taking the flight in silence. So. Instead of uh, immediately wine womaning and songing the moment we arrived. I mean, it did sound kind of dire. Why didn't we just emerge further back in time than this so we had more time to deal with it? Right. Maybe that's not how time-space works. I I don't fucking know, man. I don't know. Why didn't Thor just spin his hammer real quick to (laughs) travel through time instead of all this time cube? It's a good question. Um, Why doesn't he do that now? Yeah. These are a lot of valid questions. What did you guys think of this issue? 
think I'll whoop, whoop, whoop my <laughs> hammer and go home. <laughs> You're already home. Um, two. Well, this isn't a one. We know what a one looks like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> what it takes to get a one anywhere near one. See, that's why I've been very hesitant to ever throw out ones. Because I know what a one looks like. <laughs> this is this is two. Mm-hmm. This is two all the way. You're uh, you're dropping the ball, Len. Yeah, Len. After that, uh, wonderful issue. A fantastic issue. That's not. Let's follow that up with Thor number two forty four from November of nineteen seventy five, written by Len Wein, penciled by John Buscema, inked by Joe Sinat, colored by Glennis Wein, lettered by Joe Rosen, and the cover art is by Rich Buckler. I am. Not excited for this, Lynn. <laughs> I'm I'm not excited about this. So, either the way the panels at the end of the last issue oh. were presented was very unclear, or somewhere in the drafting of this issue, the team decided to retcon something. Because I guess the Time Twisters didn't actually appear directly in front of the protagonists. Instead... Thor and friends are watching a huge screen, which depicts the arrival of the mysterious beings. They are very tall and slender, with huge bulbous heads. This isn't quite how they looked, either. <laughs> no, no they and, were shorter. and there are exactly three of them. The God of Thunder finds their appearance unassuming, and marvels over how they can possess such destructive power while looking like such doofuses. <laughs> The Asgardians are, of course, ready to go out guns blazing, but Zarko stops them for reasons that I don't entirely understand. He basically says that they need to be strategic and gather information before rushing into battle, which is fair, I guess, but he did recruit a group of literal warrior gods to help him, so I'd say let them do what they do best and you can stay here to strategize. Yeah, yeah. Instead, he goes to some sort of console, which projects his image across the city to address his subjects. The subjugated people of the 50th century look on with apprehension (laughs) as their self-appointed leader declares that anyone who can kill one of the Time Twisters before they reach the palace will receive an unlimited power supply for the next month. This is a completely ridiculous task that is obviously impossible, but to the desperate people living on the ground, it's an offer they can't afford to ignore. And I would just like to take a small detour to note that one of the people here says that Zarko took all their power supplies away from them, which is not the vibe that we got in the last issue. You are correct. The last issue, it sounded like... He just made some promises. Yeah, so it... it right. S- last issue, it sounded like he got here after some kind of, like, <clears throat> disaster happened that ruined their society and destroyed everything, and he, like, manipulated his way into power by saying he could fix shit. Oh, no. Lynn doesn't care. <laughs> which makes sense, also, because he decided that the 30th century was too hard to take over and was looking for something easier, right? Yeah. But I guess the lore is just not very well defined and probably doesn't matter anyway. I don't think Lynn cares enough to keep track of his story. I don't know. I don't know what the fuck is going on. Like, Thor's just been... This is this is just like how uh, this is all over the place. It's It's almost as bad as changing a guy's name mid-issue. Yeah. (laughs) Thor's been all over the place lately, so I'm not, like, surprised that this is continuing to be a problem, but it this is This is going to be a solid disappointing. Two out of five. <laughs> I can feel it in my bones. Uh, Thor does not appreciate Zarko using innocent people as cannon fodder. Shocking. But the Tomorrow Man must have been taking some persuasive speaking classes, because he manages to turn that around by insisting that he didn't order anyone to do anything, he just offered them the chance to protect their home, as is their right. (laughs) And they're not doing anything that they're not choosing to do. Uh Uh Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's totally not his fault at all. Yes, it's their choice. They have 
free choice in this matter. Entirely free choice. Roll for persuasion. <laughs> Nat 20. <laughs> Despite the fact that this is clearly a bad idea, all across the city, desperate people take up makeshift arms because, of course, they don't have any actual weapons. This is what happens when you roll a nat 20 on a clearly bad idea. A young man named Derek is one such person, though his wife, Gayla, begs him not to go. She doesn't need the comforts of their former life, once again confirming that Zarko somehow overthrew this society, which I find kind of hard to believe given how bad he was at that before, but Derek would do anything to make her life better, and so he leaves despite her pleas. He joins a group of similarly motivated people as they all run in a chaotic mob to start wailing on the time twisters with their various makeshift weapons. Wow. Those who do manage to take a swing at the invaders find their blows repelled by a force field. The time twisters turn to the mob as they rally for another attack, but of course the inevitable happens as the strange extra extra dimensional beings retaliate with their beam attack, which we know from, from much experience is a sure death sentence. Beams. Beams are like... The worst. Yeah. Just the if worst. If they whip out a beam, it's fucking over, man. Doesn't matter who does it. When you whip out beams, beams mean it's over. Unless you got plot armor. True. Or beam deflecting. Or another beam. Ooh. Oh, that's true. Another beam will head off a beam yep. every time. Beam every time. versus beam. Mm-hmm. They cancel out, you know. Mm-hmm. Those, those who survive this are not looking so sure about the whole deal. But, of course, one idiot stands up to rally the troops for another suicide run. <laughs> and it is that, isn't it? It is. Uh, and this time the Time Twisters turn their eye beams on the charging humans, which rather than just hurting them a lot, somehow changes their flow of time at random. So some of them rapidly age until they shrivel up. And some regress until they turn into helpless babies and then just wink out of existence. Oh, fun. Kind of horrifying. I think I'd prefer the beams that hurt you. Yeah, yeah, I don't think I'd want that. (laughs) Having witnessed Zarko's tactics, Thor thinks it's high time to do some punching. (laughs) Yeah, he has some stern words for the Tomorrow Man. (laughs) Which honestly seems like... Not the right way to react to what just happened. (laughs) Yeah, but hey, Odin has a new fit. He does. We're not getting to that yet. Uh, First, I have some complaints. I have some complaints. (laughs) Yeah. We spend a lot of time talking about Thor's temper and how he can fly into a rage and act impulsively. Oh, God, you're right. But the one time that would actually not only be expected, but also justified, he's perfectly level-headed and even... Mild? I don't get what you're doing here, Len. I I know. Len has forgotten who Thor is, if he ever knew. Len just got here. So he probably just doesn't know what the fuck he's doing. How long do we have? A while. Len? Oh no. <laughs> so So given all that, um, you may be pleased to hear that Odin is back on his bullshit. <laughs> you, you mean he stopped? He's out here looking like fucking yeah. Need a repulsor or whatever this the is... fuck our name is from yeah, Power you, you Rangers. You are correct. He this does is... look like Rita Repulsa. In fact, a different outfit from the last issue. And this is, I think, in my opinion, the worst hat <laughs> that I've ever seen him in. <laughs> and that's including the one that's just like a golden eagle <laughs> on his head. I miss the one that was just like his bathrobe. <laughs> Oh, that's what he wears when he goes into the Odin sleep. That's his bed. Mm-hmm. That's his nighty. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so he's sitting on his throne, looking surly, as the vizier sidles up to pester him about Thor again. Like, hey, your son is being a super cool guy, fighting for the fate of the world and stuff, doing things that you would be proud of. So maybe you could stop banishing him for like a day. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Shock of shocks, Odin is still not receptive to this in the least. And in fact, he's getting pretty annoyed that Seth, too, keeps bringing it up. (laughs) 
He says that Seth has been working for him so... He bothers here. <laughs> oh, hey! I thought you would be excited about that, so I just wanted to get out of the way. He says that Seth has been working for him so long that he's gotten too familiar. Oh. And so he is being forced into retirement, which means he will go to the Tower of Solitude to read scrolls alone until Odin remembers to let him out. <sighs> no! I don't know why that is a thing, but I guess that's... What you do with retired wizards, maybe? So they can't bother you. Yeah. So now, without an advisor, Odin calls forth Balder to carry out a task. Apparently, Odin already knows who he wants to fill the position, and that, of course, is Igron. The, oh no, the Togue-like wizard. The disgraced <laughs> wizard who is not Togue, Formerly a henchy of Loki, and now residing in the castle dungeon for trying to take over Asgard. And this seems like a reasonable choice. This seems like he we is should... the man you want, right? <laughs> He's the man we want, the man who is in prison for trying to take over Asgard, as opposed to our much faithful b- vizier because he was being a little annoying. So we're going to um, put the guy who almost overthrew uh, through the throne... He'll be my advisor, my chief advisor. Surely he can be trusted. Yes. Yeah, Balder tries to point out that that's a bad idea. But of course he gets shot down. And What, do you want to get banished too, chump? And so he obediently trudges towards the dungeon. As he goes, however, he is very much beginning to question the so-called wisdom of the Allfather. (laughs) And you know what? Good for him. (laughs) Somebody being rational around here. Throw off the yoke of oppression. You can do it, Balder. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Finally, it's time for some action. Thor and the Warriors 3 are on their way to meet the Time Twisters, but Jane pleads with her man to hold off. Why? Apparently, despite witnessing the gratuitous carnage just a few minutes ago, she has decided, based on appearance alone, that these beings are both highly intelligent and gentle by nature, and have only retaliated to defend themselves. I don't think that was just defensive retaliation, but sure. sure. I don't. I don't think that's a fair assessment at all since the humans who attacked them couldn't even get past their force fields, and were also literally just hitting them with sticks, while the response was pretty hideous, hideously disproportionate. It was beams. They responded to sticks with beams. Still, she manages to get Thor to promise that he will at least try talking to them before resorting to violence, which he does for, like, The 10 seconds that it takes for him to finish talking and not wait for any kind of reply before deciding that they're not listening and shooting fire out of his hammer. Which, yes, unfortunately, is a thing that he has done before, and I do hate it every time. (laughs) It looks terrible. It's dumb. So the fire does absolutely nothing to the strange trio, but it does manage to get their attention. As one of them deigns to speak to the th- god of thunder, apparently all they needed to hear was a question, because they are required to answer questions based on the decree of whatever it is that created them. I see. Oh, fun. So they prompt Thor to ask whatever he wants, and what he wants to know is what the hell these weirdos think they're doing. The answer, of course, obviously, is that they are on a pilgrimage, beginning at the end of time and continuing onward until they find the beginning of time. Uh Uh-huh. They have journeyed through thousands of worlds, seemingly at random, I guess, and still come no closer to finding what they seek because they don't understand that the beginning is at the beginning. (laughs) Sure. Thor further inquires whether they know what happened to all those those worlds when they left, to which they respond that they think the inhabitants must be better off for getting their wisdom. Uh. (laughs) So, I may have been a bit misleading or maybe just not entirely clear earlier. Um, The truth of the matter is not that these guys are actively destroying anything, just that when they leave 
the time stream, they cause some sort of temporal disaster that destroys whatever is nearby. I don't know. I think Lynn is literally making it up issue by issue. <laughs> no, it was... That's kind of like how it was explained in the last oh. issue, but this is the first time we're learning that that effect is completely on accident. Ah. So. Um, okay, so Lynn actually put a plan in there somewhere yeah, that he remembered. It's consistent. Um, One of the only things. So Thor informs them of this problem and insists that they must stop their pilgrimage or else cause the deaths of untold more innocents. The Time Twisters understand and find this request to be reasonable, but can't agree to it. They were created, somehow, by the calamitous death of everything that is, and they have a duty that must be fulfilled when they finally reach the very beginning of all time, which is a concept that I kind of struggle to grasp, and I don't really think the human mind can understand that, and I also don't think Len even understands what he's talking about. Do people know time had a beginning at that point in I I I I don't even know. I think they're just talking about, like... This is like a Silver Age fight without the fight. This is... It's a lot. This is like Stan science, okay? This is... You're right. It is like Stan no, science. There are no facts it's or information si backing this up. It's Stan science in the 70s. This is weird. So, understandably, the Odinson does not find this agreeable. And having done his best to reason with the temporally challenged beings, he has now determined to stop them by any means necessary. Nearby, we see a single survivor of the carnage caused by Zarko's thoughtless manipulations. Of course, it's Derek, the mm -hmm. only one who had a name and any <laughs> amount of backstory. Yeah. Who Shocking. rises from the ashes of defeat. Yeah, the one guy who has a name turns out to be important somehow. Never would have guessed that. It's like um, in anime when there's like one character with pink hair. Yes, they have <laughs> protagonist color hair. He witnesses the devastation and the fate of his friends and neighbors reduced to literal dust and rags. And in the face of this horror, he finds clarity. This was intentional. Zarko led them all into a hopeless situation, fully intending for them to die. In fact... If we can go even further, Zarko is the arbiter of all his people's misery. I mean, no duh, but when you're just trying to stay alive in a hopeless situation, it can be easy to lose sight of the obvious, right? Right. What's more, uh, more importantly, after his near-death experience, Derek has found the courage and determination to do something about it. I hope he has other friends. <laughs> <laughs> Thor sounds the battle cry as the Asgardians charge, only to have the Time Twisters hit them with the timeline-distorting eye beams. Not Fortunately, that? as they are immortal, <laughs> the attack doesn't do anything. Not gonna lie, uh, the the battle cry is a little weird here. Yeah. That, I, mean, I mean, that's what they always do, though. I know, but it's getting weirder no. the, the longer they go when they're He's he's been banished. Yeah. Odin doesn't like him very much right now. Yeah. And but this he is... still cares about Odin and Asgard. True. Um so yeah, they're immortal. Um so Yeah. Uh you can't. What what are, what are those beams supposed to do, guys? Right. <laughs> the invaders find this interesting right up until Thor throws his hammer at them. Of course it's reflected off their force field, but at least he tried. The travelers then conjure a wide array of bloodthirsty warriors from across time to waylay the Thunder God and friends while they continue on their quest. Huh. I didn't bother to, like, break down this group. Yeah, but no, you, you didn't need don't to. Don't bother. It's... But, eh. but I think one's a pope. <laughs> Damn. Mm. They sent a pope. Um, well, he's gonna kill Thor, I guess, so... <laughs> The area erupts immediately <laughs> as the menfolk start doing what they do best. But fortunately for us, Jane has found a sword <laughs> and is determined to use it. She wades into battle with the skill and determination of someone who was born for this. Knowing that this is all a diversion to let the true enemy escape, 
Thor creates a storm to speed up the battle, and a flash of lightning seems for a moment to illuminate the form of Sif, warrior goddess, before the image fades once more into mortal Jane Foster. Which is cool, cool. I guess, but doesn't make a lot of sense. But it's cool, so whatever. Are we going to do Ruth something with cool that? says it's fun. Yeah, no, we're not doing anything with that. We're just saying, hey. There's, there's, a, there's a god in there. <laughs> Our heroes are able to defeat the interlopers and catch up with the time twisters who are beginning to get quite peeved with all these dramatics. I mean, I'm not shocked by that. Thor rushes forward to launch a new attack, but is halted as the ground suddenly cracks apart and a piece of concrete is shoved into his path. Sure. All around them, the world is shaking and moving out of control, reacting to some strong temporal disruption as the Time Twisters have reached their exit point and prepare to continue their journey. Ah. The world catches fire as it breaks apart and a volcano appears out of nowhere. <laughs> sure. Zarko and his servitor escape into the Time Cube, cursing the Asgardians for failing. Down on the ground, Thor has used Mjolnir to create a shield around them, which is a thing he can do, I guess. They all watch helplessly as the Time Twisters disappear, leaving only their temporal shockwave to utterly destroy the Earth of the 50th century. Rip the Earth of the 50th century. Whoops. And at the end, when the ground finally stills, the Asgardians and Jane still stand, though they're not really sure how or why. All they do know is that they failed, and in failing, doomed everyone on this world to their untimely demise. <laughs> so. What the fuck? <laughs> What'd you guys think of that one? Two. 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 What the fuck? <laughs> what the fuck is... This is, like, borderline incomprehensible. <laughs> yes! It's very Silver Age again. Yeah. Why are we back in the Silver Age? Lynn... I mean, Len is also one of the self-insert crew, so Fair. he might just be a cornball. <laughs> I mean, he, he he literally wrote, this is the way the world ends. Not with a bang, not, not with, with a, a whimper, whimper, but with, with an overwhelming sigh of relief. relief. <laughs> Very corny. He, he felt the need to take a quote, a notable quote, and change it to fit this. Yeah. Notable, quotable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, uh... That was... That was something. That was and comic. <laughs> sure the fuck was. Uh, and, uh, Lynn, you do need to say it. Uh, be here. <laughs> you, you need to say it, because you're not selling me on Thor, Lynn. Um, All right, Lynn, say it. Be here. Just like you. Be here. Next episode. Yeah. Woo! We'll talk to you then. Bye. Bye. Bye.